Okay, and we are recording. Right. Okay. Super duper. All right. So here we go. Uh, I think I'll get to... Hello, everybody. Uh, some of you have made made it through the magic filter that differentiates. I've just got to make sure that I've got everybody in the room. I'm so bad. Missing everyone. Okay. So that's super. Good evening. Um, we are recording. Uh, you're at Exploring Two, uh, the second in a sequence of events organised by the um, Sheffield Hallam University Space and Place Group. And tonight we are going underground. Um, if you can't see uh, my slides on the screen, please uh, could uh, Maria or Denzel ways fran frantically at me in an alarmed way to suggest that it's not showing. But I think by the fact they're not doing that, that it is all showing. So we're going to carry on uh, in that fashion. Um, tonight's proceedings will have uh, four presenters, uh, plus me saying a very brief introduction, uh, just to set a context. Um, and we will have presenters making their presentations for approximately 20 minutes, and then we'll have five to 10 minutes for Q&A um, for each speaker. And then at the end, we've got a bit of time uh, to have a sort of panel related discussion. Um, if you have things that spring to mind that you'd like to raise as a question as we go along, uh, please could you put it in the chat and then at appropriate points are mine, appropriate term for this evening, are mine into the chat um, and uh, field the questions and, uh, and steer the debate that way. Okay, so um, we will finish by 9.30. We might finish before then, but I will definitely guillotine um, at 9.30. Uh, we have um, we have some guests uh, and presenters from from other parts of the world for whom it feels less of a sort of late night evening kind of kind of thing. So um, for, for, for the benefit of everybody, just there's the clarity. We will finish definitely by 930, if not before. Um, the event is being recorded uh, and uh, the sort of unedited raw recording will be uploaded um, at some point in the near future to the group's YouTube channel. I emphasize raw in the sense that it's a real bit of a bind to have to edit out things. But if you say things that you really, really wish you hadn't said, then you can let me know within the next 24 hours. So the the, 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 the deadline for letting me know is seven o'clock UK time tomorrow, off, tomorrow evening. And then I'll spend all weekend trying to edit the thing to try and extract the thing that you shouldn't have said in the first place. OK, no pressure. Uh, oops. So um, that's where it will go onto the group's uh, YouTube site where we have recordings from all of our sort of post COVID um, era because uh, we moved online in COVID and we never we never became physical again. We just stayed online because it's convenient. Uh, it enables us to have international discussions and contributions. It enables us to record sessions easily, et cetera, et cetera. So we're, we're, we're staying online for the foreseeable, I think. Um, and each year the group has a themed or has a theme and a number of sessions focused upon that theme. And we've done, um, well, last year it was two themes actually running concurrently, changing places and changing campuses. Uh, prior to that, we did uh, four sessions the previous year on the theme of haunts, haunted places, haunting processes. Uh, we did one on COVID along the way. Uh, next year, we're going to do a sequence of four, possibly more uh, sessions around perceiving climate change. But for uh, this year, we're doing exploring. Uh, and uh, this is the second of four uh, events. Um, the first one back in July um, was regarding the motivations and the practices of ruin explorers, modern ruin explorers. Um, very much we're taking the notion of exploring as something that is contemporary and not looking to get involved in sort of explicitly colonial notions of exploration, but one can still argue that modern practices of exploration are somewhat colonialistic in their, in their manner. We can perhaps get into that in, in discussion. Um, this evening we're going underground to see how and why people explore underground. In a future event we're going um, into quarries uh, and rock faces to see why people would want to explore there. Uh, and uh, in December, uh, we've got uh, an event um, which is a book launch uh, with a number of talks connected to the book launch. Uh, Jim Charrington's edited collection, which is all about mountain biking. So we're getting on our bikes, metaphorically. 
from our bedrooms or wherever we're broadcasting from um, for that one. So we had three presenters for the In Ruins session. We went um, to Portugal with uh, in Inez's presentation. We've had um, uh, Denzel setting the scene for two of our events today and our previous event in, in a way that really set us up nicely. And then we had um, two artists talking about their uh, animation of a very remote rural um, uh, Cold War bunker site. No, it wasn't a Cold War bunker site. It was where it was. It was a country house and then it morphed into talking about a bunker. But anyway, watch the recording if you want to work out what I'm trying to describe. <laughs> Interesting. Um, I ended my longer presentation in, in, in the first um, session with um, some thoughts on how we might produce sort of taxonomy of modern exploration behaviours and motives. Um, and uh, in the discussion, we sort of went back to this diagram to try and think, OK, so what have we heard in our three presentations and how can we situate that within um, within that um, framework or, or, or find the framework not to be working? Um, and maybe maybe we could return to that or other other ways of trying to chart the exploration that we've been considering today. The um, sessions today for presenters each of them exploring a different underground realm, which is great. So we've got sewers, we've got old mines, and we've got two versions of caves, but they're in completely different parts of the world. So that makes them different, I think, really. Um, and we have actually also got a book launch within this session, but I'll leave I'll leave Kevin to, to do his sales pitch um, when, when we get to Kevin talking about his work and his book. Um, we have also different perspectives, and that's that's great, but maybe it's worth me saying that at the outset, that we have a spectrum of views. Um, we have very enthusiastic underground explorers, and we have some who are perhaps more critical of certain practices of underground exploration. And I think it's really healthy to have a diverse diversity of views, and we have ample time to discuss what we each feel and think about those various positions and isn't it better to have a variety of positions than just everybody monolithically agreeing with each other so i just set that just to set things up we're going to take the presenters in the order that you see them presented there on the screen and uh i'm now going to go quiet and invite each speaker in turn to make their presentation um because we keep things informal within this group we don't do big welcomes and honorific mentions of what people are about we let them explain themselves because that usually seems to work better so i will simply say someone's first name invite them to share their screen and get on with it and they should not be offended by that they should see that as an opportunity to talk about themselves rather than to hear me talking about them okay so we're cool uh right so i'm gonna i'm gonna shut up now and i'm going to invite denzel to do uh his thing i'm going to stop sharing my screen denzel okay what is yours all right let's hope this works okay right so um let me is that is that coming through okay yes we can see your presenter view currently we can't see your presentation so, is that okay there see your presentation now that's super yeah Great. OK, well, um, thank you for the opportunity to, to talk at another one of these uh, exploring. So I really enjoyed the first one. And uh, thank you for letting me talk about uh, my, my current passion, which is exploring um, underground and abandoned mines. And also, the, the you know, the, the stuff that's on top as well. There's often some interesting stuff um, above the mine as well in, in some mines. So my um, presentation is exploring the forgotten mines of England and Wales. England and Wales, because I haven't actually explored any in Scotland, so um, hopefully I'll be able to do something on that at a, at a future date. Right, okay, well, I've got the clock and I'll, I'll do my best to, to stick to time. Not to say anything that uh, requires you to do any editing, uh, Luke. So, um, let me introduce myself. Um, by day, I teach corporate finance, um, and by weekends, um, and when I'm not working, I like to do something a little bit different, um, and I like to urban explore, uh, in recent years, I've got into exploring mines. So quite different um, from my uh, my day job and talking about corporate finance and shareholder wealth maximisation. So, yeah, getting my um, getting my lightweight trousers on, getting my, uh, my my jacket and my my helmet and my torch and going down mucky mines, and they are more quite mucky as you will see as we 
progress through here. I'm also blessed with some really good um, photographer friends. So I've got two professionally taken photos of me, one contemplating going down a mine and one actually down a mine. So um, I've been exploring mines for about for about two or three years, and I've got progressively more into it. And I've, I've realised there's quite a lot in in mines. There's a lot of lot of history, um, and and mining. We've got a rich history of mining in in, Eng uh, in England and Wales. So um, it goes right back to the Bronze Age when um, copper and tin were, were mined um, fairly primitively for for weapons and and utensils and that. Um, it, mining really took off in the UK. Um, um, I suppose with the Romans, the Romans came over for the non-ferrous metals and uh, the non-ferrous minerals. That was one of the reasons uh, they came over to, to the UK. But it really went up a, a notch for the Industrial Revolution. So in the Industrial Revolution, there was a big demand for coal and iron. Um, so there was a lot of coal and, and iron ore mines um, through the 18th uh, and 19th century. And there's a, there's a little scatter map there. You can see where the different um, mines are, courtesy of Wikipedia. So, um, what is mine exploring? Well, it, it is pretty. Um, it, it is pretty much what it says on the tin. Really, it is the it is the visiting of abandoned mines to document and photograph them. Um, I have read somewhere people describe it as an amateur form of archaeology, and I suppose I suppose it is really. You're 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 going underground, sometimes trying to squeeze into different difficult spaces to to find history, and there is quite a lot of history in some of the mines. Um, so in terms of mine exploration, there is, there is overlap between um, urban exploring and caving communities. Um, but I mean, they are quite quite two dif different communities, um, which I'll say a bit more about in a moment. And there's a rather nice picture of a haulage shaft in Wales, which we had to walk up with the children. We took the children down that one. So who, who explores mines? Well, I, I would say I would say there's, there's three broad groups. There's, um, the caving community is, is well established um, in, in the UK and around the world, and there are a number of cavers who have an interest in mines. So some of the mine explorers are, are cavers. Um, often cave and mine systems are, are interlinked, um, especially with things like with um, lead mines. You know, the, the systems are often, are often interlinked and, and not exclusive. Urban explorers. So there is, um, this is my routine. I, I've started off urban exploring buildings overground. Um, and... I, I got I got I got the bug really for for mine for mine exploring. One of my friends explored a mine nearby. I went down and thought this is actually quite interesting. It's quite a challenge. I like this, so I, I've got progressively more and more interested in in exploring mines. And of course, there are some some specialist interest groups um, around ar ar around the UK. There's you know there's specialist mine mine exploring clubs. Um, we've got the um, the Peak District Historic Mining Society based in Buxton, which is very active and runs the museum and also a number of trips. So yeah, there's, and there's also there's also um, a bunch of ex miners who 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 have actually own a mine um, on Via Gelia near near Matlock. Um, so um, so yeah, a diverse a diverse group of people. Um, it's not for the faint-hearted. You can see some pictures, a couple of pictures I've taken of our recent explores. Um, so. If you don't like um, enclosed spaces, it's probably probably not for you. I'm going to squeeze that one on the right hand side. So um, let's let's get the, let's get the health and safety uh, out of the way first. It's not something that you you casually do. Um, it's something that you you have to be equipped for. And and here is sort of like a, a checklist of, of what you need as a minimum. A safety helmet is absolutely critical. And on that, a head mounted torch. Sometimes you'll be scrambling. You'll be going up ladders. So you won't have a, a hand free, uh, hand free to the torch. Um, this is critical: a torch, a spare torch, and a spare spare torch. Now that that might sound um, a little bit over the top, but whenever I take anyone down a mine who's not been down before, I say, right, put your lights out, and it's pitch black in most of them. And if you didn't have a functioning torch, you would be there for some time, um, and you may not get out alive. Um, so torches are really, really important. I can take five, five or six even. Um, spare torch batteries for the spare torch and the other torches. Suitable footwear um, that will vary depending on on which mines you're um, exploring. Sometimes, if it's a dry mine, boots are the best bet. If it's moderately wet, well is, um, or if it's really wet, waders. Um, and and sometimes it pays to, to sort of put your waders in your uh, in your back in your backpack. Um, suitable clothes, lightweight 
light, waterproof, lightweight jacket and trousers, um, which are easily washable. Um, a compass and mine survey. So uh, it, whenever I uh, whenever I explore a mine, I try to make sure uh, I can find the survey so I know where I am within the mine system. And a compass is absolutely um, critical to use with the mine survey so you can find out where you are. Drink and energy bars. And of course, if you're, one of your motivations is to photograph the mine, then some camera gear. Um, the torches are really handy there to paint the light. A good tripod as well. A good tripod is really important um, because often you're, you're working in absolutely zero light conditions. Some mine explorers um, do more extreme trips. Um, and as we as we look at the different types of mine later on, um, you'll see that some mines you'll you'll need a gas meter to check what the you know what, whether there's any carbon monoxide or dioxide or any oxygen depletion. Knee pads often um, you might do some crawling. So knee pads are, are a bit of a lifesaver. If you're in a particularly wet cave, um, a, a particularly wet mine, a waterproof bank to put all your electronic items in. Um, some mines, um, specifically sort of lead mines, have false floors, and sometimes there's holes in the floors. So cowtails, carabiners, and, and a safety belt can also come in handy for those. Um, and, and some mine explorers, perhaps the ones that have come from the caving side, will use SR, SRT gear so they can go between different levels of the mine. But um, so really, the, the important thing is that you you know you have got the minimum gear with you when you go into the mine. Top tips: um, always tell someone um, where you are going, um, what time you're enter entering, and what time you're expected back out in the mine. Um, that's always very good. Pro, uh, very good. Um, that's all. Very, well, what I was going to say, but very, very good. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Help me, Luke. I forgot the word. Very good. Um, I've gone blank. Preparation. Preparation is the word. Um, also, try not to explore mine solo. I mean, I guess we all do some exploring solo at times, um, but but please make sure um, that you know you, you're trying to go with a friend. Research the mine that you're exploring and take the appropriate kit, which we've just talked about. Um, and for say for lot for large mines, always take, especially large mines where you might get lost. Um, take a map and a compass. Um, in terms of hunting out mines, sometimes it's quite difficult to find. Um, where the mine entrance is. So um, there's a really good resource of old OS maps, which which map the mines out and they show the entrances. So the old OS map uh, online resource is, is your best friend when it comes to actually locating the adit and shaft entrances. Okay, hazards, mines can be dangerous. So um, it's really important that you're aware of what the dangers are and you're constantly assessing and managing the risk. Th these, are, these are the main um, risks that you face. Collapses, um, to be honest, um, you'd be really unlucky to be under a collapse when it happens. I mean, you do see collapses in mines, so don't hang around under um, structures where the rocks look a little bit loose. False floors um, are an issue. Um, an issue um, in certain mines, as we mentioned already, so like lead mines, often you think you're walking on, on solid ground, but you're not. You're actually walking on a false floor um, on beams which may be rotting. Um, shafts. Uh, are opening the mine uh, at, a ground, at a ground level, you need to make sure you don't fall down. Make, most of the time, farmers will cover them up. Winds is, uh, are internal shafts, so when you're exploring the mine, you may come across um, an internal shaft. Sometimes they're right in the middle of the adit and you have to sort of gingerly um, skirt around them. Um, and we've already mentioned the gas, the gas issues. The main, the main issues are carbon monoxide, um, CO2, um, an oxygen depletion, especially in things like iron ore mines. So just be aware of the hazards. Do your research. Paving clubs tend to report on, on, on what the conditions are in mine. It's a bit like looking at the weather forecast before you go out walking. Make sure that you've got the latest intel on the mine. So um, I challenge myself to come up with five reasons why, um, why you should mine explore. Um, and I think the first one is, is the location. Um, for a lot of the mines, they're in incredibly beautiful locations. So actually getting to the entrance of the mine is, is a joy in itself. And, and that is the fantastic walk up from um, Blenar Thistiniag up to Con Coglon Mine, which you'll see a picture of later there in really beautiful scenery. So that that's, that's also part of the joy. Before you go underground, you're, you're often walking through really beautiful scenery. Um, there's a bit of exploring all of it, and obviously the theme of these talks is about exploring. And it does feel like you're exploring when you when you go into a mine. Um, you, you very rarely meet people. I, I don't think I've met many people in mines 
um, other than the group that I'm with. So there is this real sense that you you are exploring and you are seeing things that not many people have seen. Um, but it's not it's not for the faint hearted. Um, on the left there is the is the uh, the tube that you have to squeeze down to get into jug holes. Um, so that, that, that's a that's a bit of a that's a bit of a squeeze. And there's a picture of me in the mine looking at one of the old slate trucks with slate on so yeah i mean you really are finding history in situ it's like a living museum my my third my third sort of reason why i like to explore mines is the is the photographic challenge so before i i started going in the ground i'd always been taking pictures um with, with plenty of light maybe low light but but never in a situation where there was no light so that that really does upskill your you know your photographic skills. You you need you really need a tripod, and you need to paint the light. Um, and so really you're you're in control of the light, but you've you've got to be creative. Um, and it's really hard. I'm, I'm still not an expert, um, and I, I st I'm still envious of a lot of other people's photographs underground. Um, so I, I was actually quite pleased with that one. That one's a, a ganister mine just north of Sheffield. So I was actually quite pleased with that. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting colours underground, but obviously in the dark, um, you can't see them. And it's when you shine the light on them, you actually see the colours. And depending on what light, what type of light you shine on them, it depends on on, on how the colours reflect and, and are in your photograph. And number four um, is the history aspect. So I alluded to this earlier. Some mines you'll find no history. In other mines, you'll find lots and lots of history and some really interesting stuff. So some mines have just been have been absolutely fantastic. So the one on the left, I think, is a is a miner's lamp um, in a certain mine in Derbyshire. Um, there is is a is a winch uh, in a chert mine that we'll have a little bit of a look at later on. Um, and there's some other mining detritus in the other picture. So you'll find all sorts of things. You'll find bottles of ginger beer that they were drinking from. You'll find you always almost find a spade every time you go down a mine. You almost always find a a spade of a broken handle on. Um, that's your sort of uh, your standard thing. But sometimes you get some really, really interesting stuff um, in the mines. Um, the fifth thing is the geology. So I studied geology at uh, an Oxford University. I'm, I was really interested in, in rock mineralogy. And obviously in mines, you're right down in there. Um, and I've just realised all of those pictures come from lead mines in Derbyshire. Um, they're fantastic. They have a lot of flowstone, a lot of calcium deposits. If you're a geologist, it, it really is a joy being underground and, and, and actually looking at the rocks and minerals in situ uh, that were mined. So there we go. Hopefully by um, giving you those five uh, those five reasons, I've now explained why um, my, my exploration is, is so exciting and uh, such a joy. So um, mines differ. I mean, the, you, you tend to find that there are some commonalities with mines but um the mines differ with what what is being mined as you'd expect so i just thought for the remaining um six or so minutes i'd just take you through some different mines that i've explored in england and wales um so i'm going to start with perhaps the high most high profile mines and that's the slate mines predominantly located in north wales um recently um designated a, a, a unesco world heritage site um, so, so that further raised their profile. They're very, very large. They're extremely large mines, and you could spend lit literally a whole day in some of these in some of these mines. That the multi levels the levels are, are like mazes. Um, they're really quite interesting, and there's often a lot of machinery still left down there because it was so hard to bring it back out out of the mine. Um, it's also interesting because you do sometimes come across the natural light because. A lot of the mines are actually quarry mines um, where you will find these sort of cathedrals of light shafting into certain to certain um, mines and certain parts of the mine. But they are very large. Um, there is a picture of a, of a quarry mine that's located up a, a Welsh mountain, which is a bit of a struggle to get to. But when you look at that, it's almost hard to get any any sense of scale there. Uh, but it was very, very big. Um, so you'll find that um old maps i mentioned old maps and said that they were very useful so here's here's a an ordnance survey uh, extract for Congon mine um they're very useful for locating the adits you can see how the mechanics of the mine works so here they had a number of a number of levels to extract the um the slate the, the tips were were fairly 
fairly close to the to the levels, and then the slate was brought down a steep incline to the mill for processing, for then to be sent onwards for the railway onto to Carnarfon and onto the the boats to ship around the world. Um, this here is a mine um, that uh, called Ribak Mine, where um, you know you can actually go down there as a trip. So we took the family down here. Um, there's there's access to the mine with um, this com the company that we went with called Go Below, and it, it was it was really fascinating. We we upsailed, um, we we zip wired, we waded through water. It, it was really quite an authentic experience. So if you don't want to go down mines on your own, you can take these guided tours. Um, these, these sort of adventure tours of mines in, in Wales, and it, it is a really authentic experience. Um, this is one I explored on my uh, on my own. This one, this one was a little bit um, scary. This was an enormous mine, um, and I'm, I, I won't say where it is. Um, this place here is um, is probably unrecognized. It's probably very recognisable. This is um, Minor Ferran, um, and this is just outside of um, Blenheim Vineyard, which is a really good place to base yourself. Um, this, this place is particularly interesting because there's a lot of interesting stuff above ground. So in the top left photo, you'll see the, an absolutely enormous slate processing sheds there. Loads of old machinery um, still left behind. So that's very, very interesting. The mine itself is, is very, very big. Um, and I think because I was on my own, I didn't go too deep in there uh, and get lost. So uh, I just sort of gingerly came into that, that mine. Um, but obviously, I need to go back there at some point. Um, this is another never mine that I went in where I had to wade up through the through the inner ladder, and then I was I was greeted by these fantastic um, railway networks. Unfortunately, though, just after these two uh, these two um, tunnels had split, both of them ended in a collapse. But uh, I thought that was quite a nice relic there in terms of the the transport they used to get the slate out of the mine. Um, and this is another this is another classic mine called Verzgen Mine. Um, you go in via a kilometre long adit. So it's a very straight long drive into the mine. And then you get to this, this, this big open space called Piccadilly Junction. And there's all sorts of different mining um, relics here. There's a turntable there. There's lots of cogs. So that is a really, very interesting mine. Um, there is a through trip um, where you can go through this mine and another one and go on boats and zip wires. But that's probably for um, the more hardened uh, cave explorer. So after going to Wales, I want to come back um, a little bit more local to um, the Gannister and Fire Clay Mines of the Sheffield area. Now these are these are lesser known uh, and lesser common. They're predominantly around the northwest um, area of Sheffield, and they're small mines. They're, they're fairly small mines. They're small scale drift mines, and sadly, most of them have, have now disappeared. Um, but this, these, these sort of almost these sort of the cost industry mines are really important, um, and they mined. Um, ganister and fire clay, which was then processed to make fire brick to to um, line the Bessemer converters um, for making yeah, for making steel. So they were they're not really very well known the ganister mines of Sheffield, but they were actually a very important cog in the in the, in the industry. I've done a lot of research, and if I probably did a P if I did a PhD, I'll probably do it on ganister and clay fire clay mining in Sheffield. There's not many mines about. Um, here's an old OS map of a fire, the fire, a fire clay mine you're about to see, which is in Loxley Wood, um, which is still accessible. You'll see there's a the common features of a tramway. Um, you'll see a couple of addicts and then a, a steep incline down to the factory where the fire bricks were made. It's a very uh, the fire clay mines are very mucky, and they can be a little bit sketchy. Um, so I didn't go too far into this one. Um, so fire clay um, is lower down in the ge in the geological um, strata. Ganister, this is the ganister mine here. This is probably one of the only ganister mines left. This is a harder rock, um, it's crystalline. Um, so you can see that the mine is actually very different. So here the rock was was mined, crushed up, and then made into fire brick. Um, and nearby is this fantastically um, built stone. Um, this is a culvert to culvert the river away from the mine so the mine didn't flood and that, that's quite a beautiful little uh, little culvert that and then unfortunately this was a, another fire clay mine where we, we managed to locate it and then we got it and then we found out it was all closed up I just realized I'm, I'm up to the 20 mark um 20, is it 20 is 25 minutes all right Luke is that okay or not and less question time right okay so um I definitely want to say about lead mines because I've spent a lot of time um looking at lead mines 
the the access is fairly open access, and and the caving the various caving clubs negotiate access with um you know the the the, uh, the landowners. There's a, there's a large amount of lead mines in Derbyshire uh, and the northeast and northwest of England. Again, the small mines, the the light gunnister mines, and they're, they're small, but they're they're more robust and they've survived. There's many, many examples that um, survive today and, and are accessible. They're very interesting because they're mined via something called stoping, which I'll, I'll show in a moment. But you must be aware of those false floors that I mentioned. Sometimes you think you're on solid ground, but you're actually not. So a lot of, a lot of maps, um, a, lot of, a lot of useful maps that you can use. There's a, a map of Merlin Mine just outside Tony Middleton. And as you can see from this map, um, the mine sort of splits between being being addicts and, and man-made to opening up into into caves and caverns. So, so that that shows you how sometimes mines and caves intertwine. Um, they are quite stoopy. Um, they're, they're pretty solid in terms of in, in terms of the actual mine infrastructure itself, but they, they can be quite stoopy and they can be quite wet, as I found out the other day. Um, here's one of the first mines I went in. This was this was easy to get to and very interesting. This is hanging this is hanging flat mine, and it's interesting because you've got um, you've got one of the old um, tubs that they used to transport the 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 um, the iron ore. Uh, sorry, the iron ore, the lead ore out of the mine. You can see the compressed air um, tubes there running along the side, and you can also see you can also see some polystyrene boulders there in the um, the picture on the right top and that's because they actually shot um an edition of i think it was some it was some tv series i think it was peak practice they shot down there and they they, they left some polystyrene boulders so that was quite surreal when i bumped into the boulder and it moved that was quite that was quite surreal but that hanging 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 flat mine a, a lead mine um and so back, back to the back to the sort of um you know the mineralogy some of them some of the the lead mines you'll find this beautiful this beautiful sort of banding um i think we call them cave pearl where the water has washed um the limestone and formed these beautiful sort of smooth pebble pebbles um and so here's here's another another mine um another large uh, another large lead mine um just in the peak district and you can see the bucket and a rusty spanner uh, and on the bottom, you can see an addict splitting into into two levels. So there's an addict there. There's a tunnel going to the to the right, the higher level, and the tunnel to the left going down to the lower level. So there were multiple there were multiple levels for these these lead mines. And on the right is a, a picture which illustrates the practice of of stoping, where um, you would drive the addict into you drive the addict into into towards the vein. Once you you hit the vein, you'd then follow the vein and you'd mine upwards. And miners would hang off these mining mining the uh, the lead ore. They're not really an occupation, so they're faint hearted. Um, and again, another another Darish lead mine. Um, you can see here again a lot of a lot of mining detritus, um, saws, bottles, all sorts of things, paraffin cans. And on the right, an engine shaft with water coming down. So you you, you can get quite wet. So um I'll just say something very quickly about chert mines, mainly in Derbyshire, single level, mined for, for the stone to make grinding wheels to, to grind um, flint for usage in the pottery making process. Um, there's a very nice mine at home bank chert mine. The blue bits are, are flooded. So this mine sometimes attracts cave diving, which is something I'm not going to go anywhere near ever. This is a very big single level mine and it's a little bit like a maze so you do have to make sure that you don't get lost but a very interesting mine it's got the, the transport rails in situ um it's got old um trans it's got it's got the old carts and used to cart the, the dirt around and, and all sorts of other detritus um and yeah it's it's a good it's a good beginner's mine um because i say it's it's not particularly treacherous and I say as long as you've got a map you won't get lost um I was going to talk about iron ore mines, um, but I've obviously run out of time. Iron ore mines uh, also exist. One thing I will say, um, coal mines are not to be explored. Um, they don't feature in this presentation because they're, they're really out of bounds. They were mined by deep shaft. They've now mostly been capped and um, really don't um, recommend going down them because of the dangerous gases. So I think coal mines are, are one mine that you won't explore. So, Try to get a lot of attention <laughs> and failed. Sorry about that, uh, Luke. Thank you for, for listening.
Thank you very much, Denzel. Um, I, I, I've been thinking halfway through your presentation, how do I say the following sentence without it sounding patronising or sarcastic? It is not intended to be patronising or sarcastic. I love your enthusiasm. Thank you. That's why I put you on first, because I want you to sort of radiate that. I love doing this. This is what I do. And here are some pictures. Um, yeah, that was pretty much it. Okay. <laughs> well, no, no, it's not to diminish it. That's to say, you no. know, that's to up the, up the positive. Here comes yeah. the lawyerly bit, because I'm the lawyer in the room, and I'm also the, the person who's organising this event on, uh, under the branding of Sheffield Hallam University. Let me just let me just do the lawyerly bit, the caveat that probably needs to be added strongly into this um, whole presentation. Inspired by your enthusiasm, Sheffield Hallam University does not condone people putting themselves in danger, going underground enthusiastically or otherwise. Um, uh, Denzel has outlined many dangers involved in putting yourself underground in situations uh, in which uh, you would need to really know what you were doing in order to safely cope with that situation. So here, for the record, and it's not a telling off of you, Denzel, it's just a thought inspired by your enthusiasm. And I said that this event would be made up of various perspectives. So I'm adding the cautiously loyally institutional perspective here. So just make it clear in relation to all these presentations, going underground in many ways is bonkers. Right? So, you know, just on behalf of the cautious uh, ground level folk, um, only go underground if you really know what you're doing. Go with people who know what they're doing. And as you've said, take all the proper kit with you if you decide to go. We're not condoning people going underground, but if you want to go, go prepared. So I, 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 thank you very much for setting us off with a, uh, a lovely, positive um, outlook. Uh, and I'm now going to hand over to Kevin, and I suspect we're going to get even more of the same, but from a slightly different angle. Kevin, don't want to steal your thunder, but um, the floor is... Oh, no, sorry, I need to give questions, don't I, first? Um, so, sorry, didn't didn't mean to cut you off there in, in, in your prime, Denzel. Uh, I I think the question... that I've looked at the chat, I can't see anything. Please, if you have questions, folks, put them in the chat now. Um, how much of this, Denzel, is about history? Because because you you gave us your presentation last time about surface level exploration of ruins. Yeah. So I was sensing the driving thing there was more the image, but I'm sensing here it's more about excavating a sense of history and system. Yeah, I, I mean, I think history plays a big part in it. I mean, sometimes you'll go to a mine and there's no occasionally you know you go to a lead mine and there's no there's no remnant of of what went on there. Um, so I'm, I much prefer mines where you can you can see the machinery, you can see the conditions that the, the miners lived in. Because, I mean, obviously, you know, for some of these communities, the mines were the major employer. Um, and they were, you know, his, from an economic and social history point of view, they were, they were very, very important. So, yeah, the history is really strong. I, I mean, it is something that's really interesting. And a part of the photography thing is really documenting this history because, it, it, you know, it brings rust. Um, you know, mines collapse and, and that history gets gets lost. So yeah, there is a strong sense of, of history in there. Um, and there's a, there's a large amount of, of, of literature out there um, in terms of, in terms of the slate mining. I mean, there's whole textbooks on 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 slate mining and the industry. Thank you, thank you for that. I'm just gonna unmute because I think Jim, you've got your hand up. Did you want to speak a question? Jim, you'd need to un unmute, but I think you're able to unmute now. Or are you asking permission to go to the loo? I don't know. Jim? Yeah, can I just add, obviously, there's no there's no facilities, there's no toilet facilities um, in mind. Okay, Jim, Jim's saying it won't let him un unmute. Um, Jim, do you want to just type in your question? Because um, I've, I've, I've pressed all the buttons that I think would unmute you. Um, so I'm not quite sure what's happening there. So we'll just give Jim a moment to um, sketch out a question. Um, okay, so his question is, are you documenting history? And documenting is in quotation marks. Yeah, so I mean, I've, I've done quite a lot of work um, with the with the Gannister mines. So I'm, I'm really conscious that this is an important part of, of Sheffield's history and it's fastly disappearing. So I have quite systematically gone to where the mines are to try and document them and find what's left. And in some cases, it, you know, it, there isn't a lot left and you're really looking on the surface for, you know, for things. 
So, so yeah, especially with the ganister mining, you know, that that is something that is is disappearing and could be lost. Um, and if it wasn't for um, David Batty's book on lost and forgotten mines in Sheffield, a lot of it would have would have been lost already. Yeah. I guys, sorry, I'm I'm off mute now. It's allowed me to do that. Sorry. Oh, okay, um, go for it. I was I was frantically clicking the unmute button and it wouldn't allow it. Um, I don't know what's happened there. And I realised now my question sounded quite daft because it was a two-parter. And you kind of answered, are you documenting history in the first part of your, in the answer to the first question. So apologies yeah. for that. The, the second part of the question was, are you, to play devil's advocate, are you documenting history? Or in some cases, and maybe there's a crossover here, are you trying to reimagine it? Um, I always remember Kev saying that when he goes into some of these buildings, it's about imagining yourself at that time and what it would be like. So I just wondered what your take on was on that. Yeah, list. so I mean, I, I mean, I suppose you know when when some urban explorers go to places, they arrange the items and try to create a mood. Um, I suppose really when we go to to, to mines, we, we we take what we take pictures of what's there. So it, I think it really is documenting. We're trying to make it look, you know, I suppose there's a, there's a strong photographic um, element to it. So we're trying to make it look good for, talk, for you know from a photographic point of view. But yeah, the, there is there is that documentary documenting it before it's gone. Definitely. And and you know for for you know when you when you sort of go down mines you you research them, um you know you do you do you do research them beforehand and sometimes you can't find a lot of information about the mines so you know sometimes these these are some of the first pictures that you've you know you've you've seen of them and the ones you've taken yourself. Okay. You tend to find with cavers, cavers um, the cavers that do mines, they tend to be more interested in going through the system, um and and, and more extreme exploring and, and photography does seem to be less of a thing we you know mine explorers don't tend to do a, a lot of my friends don't do srt so we're not going between levels and trying to go through the system we're really trying to find the interesting things and document and photograph those in an authentic manner okay and i suppose the other thing of course is that um you know these these were dark places um and the miners were down there with were down there with you know with candlelight mm. so we're, we're very much shining a torch so i suppose in, in that sense we are we, we we are adding something and we were illuminating the mine in a way that it wasn't really illuminated. So I suppose that it potentially is an, is, is an artificial aspect of it, but it, it's sort of unavoidable, really. Well, interestingly, um, there is a question now in the chat from Kyle, which which sort of extends and explores that aspect by taking darkness in a slightly different direction. So the question is, as mines are often the scenes of industrial accidents and dreadful workplace conditions, what impact does this have upon your experience or how you view the site? Is this dark tourism? Um, I, I don't really think of it as dark tourism, no. And, I mean, you do have an awareness. I mean, sometimes you'll see things which are really poignant. Um, so in a lot of the lead mines, some, you know, they've, they've actually carved their name in the wall and a date. Um, so, you know, it, it does sort of bring home, you know, that it, it, the local people down here working a lot of the time and their family followed it. Followed themselves, followed their, you know, their parents down the mine, um, and it was hard. It was really, really hard. Um, but what sort of comes across is there was there was a sort of some sort of camaraderie. There was quite a strong camaraderie with the miners, and although it was hard, they, they, it was their realm, and you know, it, they, they they almost felt at home in this. I mean, it was it was really, really violent at times when they're blasting rocks from the ceiling. There was a lot of it, you know, a lot of, you know, they're all well documented, a lot of underground accidents. So there were extreme places. So, yeah, I suppose in that sense, we are seeing them in, in a very quiet, in a very quiet and tranquil, you know, um, manner compared with what they were before. Um, but no, I, I don't, don't really see it as dark. I haven't really thought about it as, as being dark tourism, to be honest. No. Tourism in the dark. Tourism. All right. Tourism in the dark. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, the, Tourist, tour, tourism seems to, I, I say bit tourism with being on organised trips. Okay. So I, I, I see that being a little bit odds with exploring. Um, but I, I mean, and, and this is very much, ex, very much exploring, to be honest. I, I, you know, a lot of these mines are, you know, some of the mines have been explored. Some of the mines haven't, some parts of the mines haven't been explored. You know, so you are seeing things that people haven't seen before. Final question for me. So what's left on your underground bucket list? Um, some of that that very big um, well slate mine at Manufferen, which is about thirteen levels, and I didn't want to go down on my own with two torches. Um, but the sensibility got the better sense of valor there, so I'd like to go back to to there to explore that properly. That's great. Thanks very much, uh, Denzel. That's lovely. And um, right, we're going to move on to um, Kevin 
now. Thank you very much. So I'll just uh, I'll just set up my slides. I won't be a second. All right, that should appear any second. Yeah, that's looking good, Kevin. We can see it. Oh, perfect. Good stuff. I'll uh, I'll make a start then. Um, so today's my presentation today. Then um, it's going to be about um, my uh, new book, uh, which is about Kevin. Um, it's really an opportunity to plug the book a little bit because um, I've not done much promotion work, so I'm, I'm using it as that really. Um, I'm quite bad at, at, at promoting these materials, um, so we'll give it a go today. Um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to give really a, a quite, a, I suppose, a, a broad overview of the book rather than a concise kind of um, insight into what the chapters really entail. So I'm um, really, if I did, if I went to too much depth, there'd be no reason to buy it. Um, so I'm just going to give a nice overview and a bit of an introduction really as to how the book came about and a little bit of sort of um, history of kind of, of what led to that as well. Okay. So things take place, the whole thing starts um, on the back of my own beginnings really. And I'm from a, a small town called Newton Aycliffe. Um, this is a, a very flat place. Um, and it's very difficult if you're interested in underground places to go underground in a very flat place. Um, but for some bizarre reason, myself and a good few friends that I went to school with, we always had this um, bizarre fascination with just underground places. We we're a bit obsessed with them while we were growing up. Um, we they were old, um, quite close to where we where we grew up. There was a big industrial estate. Um, it had lots of old abandoned buildings, old pillboxes from the Second World War period, um, and there was rumours that there were old tunnels underneath there. That um, these were pillboxes to guard um, the munitions factories during the Second World War, uh, and there were rumours, you know, things that sort of circulate throughout school and things that there were these old tunnels underneath, um, and if you could access them through the pillboxes. So we used to ride our bikes out there to try and discover them and, and uncover them. Um, at first, obviously, you were a bit scared to go inside the pillboxes, but then eventually, as we started to, to venture inside, we quickly discovered that it was all a lie. There weren't actually any underground places there at all, um, which was a bit disappointing. Um, I would say that I, that didn't deter us from the, the underground. We still wanted to get underground because, again, we had this weird fascination. Um, so one afternoon, we decided it was during a summer, a school summer holiday, um, that we'd actually dig our way underground. We'd see if we could dig our own bunker. Uh, it sounds mad. It probably is. We we borrowed some um, spades, uh, a wheelbarrow from my dad's shed. We nipped out to the woods and we spent six weeks digging this massive hole in the floor. Um, and when we, it was huge, to be honest, by the time it was done. Um, we needed a ladder to kind of get in and out, we had to chisel steps out, out of the side of it. Uh, we even put a roof on top of it. Um, and we were we were set to kind of have our first sort of you know uh, afternoon inside this bunker until one of them fell through the roof of this thing, which put a giant hole in the top. Um, a week later, it rained. It rained constantly for a week, um, and we came back. And what we'd really built was a large woodland pond. Um, so that was really the end of our, our underground dream. So with not much um, sort of not much underground spaces to go for, we really. I think it was the natural shift. We moved into this thing called urban exploration, um, which wasn't really a thing. It wasn't called urban exploration when we first started doing it. It just happened. We we lived in an industrial place with lots of abandoned sites. I mean, the town centre, which you can see there on, on one of the photographs, um, around that time, loads of shops were becoming abandoned. You know, um, they were going bust, that sort of thing. Uh, there was a, a big section that was a part hospital, part dentist. That was all abandoned at the time big old clock tower that was becoming abandoned. So it was a town really on its decline, particularly as new things like Tesco and, and Argos were opening at the other end of it. So we just spent a lot of our childhood exploring these places. So that's that's the beginnings anyway. Um, and what that led to is, is what my first study, which was in urban exploration. So I, I wrote a previous book about urbex um, and that took me all over the place. Um, I ended up, like I said, studying in it. Um, I went across to New Zealand, spent years um exploring all kinds of places um some of those were including mines as well um and what took took me all over europe and um, took me to australia all sorts of places um and the whole time i think i was always dragged back to that that the the lure of this underground space really um what, what i tend to find with abandoned buildings is that they quickly become 
Um, a little bit mundane, I suppose, particularly if you're going in just the everyday hospitals or if you're just going in just normal, I don't know, an abandoned farmhouse, for example, they become dull quite quickly. They're, they're pretty samey. The things you find in them as well um, become a little bit samey. And as, as interesting as the history is in these places, the vast majority of urbexes don't really have, um, you know, hi histories that are that interesting. So I think um, there was something different about the underground. There's always a story and there's always that sense of mystery as well. Um, which which always appeals. So I think that's the the part of the lure that, that brings you back there. Um, transitioning to Caven then, it was on the back of urban exploration that really led to Caven. This this was really my gateway into it. I hadn't really done any Caven, not proper Caven or anything, um, beyond outwards bound centres when I was growing up in perhaps primary school and secondary school. Um, but again, that was just that was just guided stuff. Uh, what we discovered while we were in, we were in a, a bit of a Victorian culvert uh, one afternoon, and we just happened to stumble across a, a weird opening in the side. So, you know, just being curious, we decided to crawl inside, have a little look around the space. And what we discovered on the other side wasn't man-made; it wasn't um, created by people. It was natural. It was this strange space that was a bit muddy. It smelt different. It was away from the sounds of vehicles or. Sometimes when you're in a drain, that sort of space, if a car goes over the top of the grill, it, it reverberates throughout the tunnel and you can you can really hear it, you feel, um, you know, like you're beneath the city. All of a sudden, we're in this silent place. It was starkly different to anything we'd experienced, but there was kind of a weird bug that you got from being in this space. Um, very, very different, like I say. So that was our first taste. Um, it was only, only a small bit of cave as well. Uh, it turned out that little piece of cave had been mined into uh, and then it continued into a, a coal mine, which Denzel said, don't stray into coal mines, which you probably shouldn't do. Um, but we had a little mute about anyway. Um, but you really shouldn't go into coal mines. Um, but that's our, our initial introduction. Um, there is a bit of a lie there, I suppose, because there was an attempt number two in 2014 where we did try. We tried to dabble in Caven again. And as you can see, we weren't dressed for the occasion. Um, Really, with having no experience in caving, we, you know, we, we had no real background in it. Um, a lot of us were cavers, so we had some knowledge of rope work. We had some knowledge of um, climbing technique, that sort of stuff. Absolutely clueless, I suppose, when it came to caving. Um, so this was us uh, attempt of Giant's Hall. We decided to have a little go inside. Didn't have any ropes. We took a makeshift rope ladder instead um, to get down Garland's pot. Um, and then I, I don't even think we all had a torch, to be honest. I think we were sharing torches. Um, and as you can see, we weren't dressed for um, in the appropriate sort of gear. But this was us dabbling at Caven, I suppose. Um, quite quickly, we got scared. So we got into the, there's a bit called a crab walk in there after you get down Garland's pot. Um, quite quickly, we got scared. We got a little bit put off. Um, some of them, some of the guys I was with were a bit claustrophobic. We got wet. Um, it was all in all, it was a bit miserable. So we we quickly got back out um, and then vowed to never go caving again. But fortunately, the bug did come back. Um, and that's really where um, this new book comes about. And I, I just, before I get on to talk about that, I just want to talk a little bit about this lure that I keep mentioning. Um, and I find that there's something special, um, and in the book I call it the Kingdom of the Dark, um, sporadically throughout. And I think the thing that really appeals or really attracts to me is the fact that um, it's perhaps one of the last sources of true discovery um, that we can access ourselves, you know, as adventurers, um, particularly in the 21st century where everything's becoming, you can access it online or, um, you know, you can watch it, you don't even have to go and experience it these days. Um, I think it's a place you have to actually visit to feel a lot of these things. Um, the other thing I particularly like, I think the thing that appeals is that uh, you end up in a labyrinth-like reality. Um, it's a place that you could easily get lost, um, you know, if you can't interpret the maps, um, which I must say, when we first went into, when we started to explore these places, we hadn't got a clue how these cave maps worked, because they don't work like an ordnance survey map. They're, they don't read in quite a logical manner, um, as you would perhaps if you were walking up a mountain. Um, so we got that completely wrong. Um, but you get you get to terms with it, you get used to it once you start to realise that, that these these places are just different, that work differently. Um, and I think on the back of that, that makes you think, I think it's it's just different in an ontological sense. I think this is where you can leave a lot of your, your identities or back on the surface, your surface kind of identities, those roles that you're almost prescribed in everyday life, you can leave those behind as well. Um, you, you become someone quite starkly different as well once you start doing cave properly and you, you start to get some of the proper gear. 
So by the time um, I, I did move into Kevin, we started to um, get into the SRT stuff. We started to, to do things properly by this stage. So we decided to revisit, but but do it sensibly. <clears throat> so that's what led to, to the book. What I f found first of all, though, was that there was a bit of a challenge. So I was trying to find a gap, really, you know, a, um, a kind of a way of, of writing something novel, something a bit original. Um, and to do that, I had to go and find out what's been written before. And what I found was that two major things themes of or it's been approached in two major directions i suppose the vast majority of the literature um, and that's through this adventure lens and then through this uh, speleologist lens and um, so th the first lens is this this idea that adventurers um have gone off you know these legendary figures back in the 1800s and and, and so on um, and these were people exploring unknown places people haven't been down there before um, that's martel in the picture uh, for instance who uh, was the first to descend gape and gill um, it's a colossal um, open cave shaft. Um, it's a waterfall. Um, he was the first one to descend it on a rope ladder, um, much to the disappointment of um, all the Yorkshire people in the area because he was French, um, so he beat them to it. Um, it had been tried before, but, you know, it, it, this guy managed it. And none of the equipment that we, we use today either. Um, so this is one of the, the major lenses, and we've got legendary figures who went out and explored these places, and the books that they produced on the back of it are very much adventure books, um, in the sense that they, they explore it in a, a very sort of personal manner. Um, you could say an ethnographic manner, I suppose. Um, and then you get a good feel of the place, but they don't necessarily do anything theoretical with it, really. They don't do anything um, sociological with it. So I, I felt there's probably a gap there that I could maybe um, try to fill a little bit. Now, the second lens, um, th this, this is the lens from more of a scientific standpoint um, or the sport in science. Um, without going too much into the history, just because I'm conscious of time, um, what we found was that Caven became quite scientific in the way that it was viewed. And there were, there were two directions that that took. One was in a sport in science where, um, so it was seen as a, a, a sport, but it had a scientific purpose to it, whether that was mapping caves, whether that was finding water systems and so on. Um, the other side of it was to reject this, the idea that it was a sport. It was something far more serious than that. You know, it was a, a, a proper science. It's something that should have its own department in a university. Um, so very much, um, a, you know, very much like if you were to have a department in chemistry in, in a university, this would be equal on part of that. Um, so very serious figures that are involved in this in in Kevin and, and the papers and things that they'd written are, are obviously very scientific in perspective. Um, I'd spent a bit of time trying to get to know some cavers at the beginning of the study, and what I found was that the vast majority were a little bit, I suppose, standoffish. They're a little bit suspicious of uh, outsiders. Um, not surprised to be honest. You know the way that we kind of probably came across probably looked quite uh, inexperienced, which we entirely were. Um, but all in all, not that kind of receptive to, to outsiders, and, and that's the way I would probably describe us. Uh, there was a, a scholar called David Matlas, um, who just, he talks a little bit about English countryside and the invasion of outsiders. He calls them anti-citizens or the, the cultural grotesque. Um, and what he argues is that as the countryside opened up to, you know, the general public, the masses from the cities, um, all of these anti-citizens started to enter the countryside um, and, and started to change the way, you know, the, the nature of the countryside. And I suppose people like myself are perhaps a threat um, to the control and authority um, of, of caves of these spaces. So part of the book is a challenge against that, and I use Zygmunt Bauman's idea of legislators and interpreters to help explore that point a little bit further. Uh, Zygmunt Bauman's a Polish sociologist who, who argues that legislators have typically dominated um, the, the old modern world, uh, the world of solid modernity, as he calls it. Um, and these are people that, that govern, that create the rules, that have the power and um, the authority to really control that. And my argument is that there's in the everyday world the 21st century perhaps the weight and the authority of legislators is perhaps on the decline but in certain sports and certain you know physical activities it still exists it's still quite powerful um and part of the argument in the book is is exactly that that the, the sports like Kevin, which is still very very traditional and um, that's still dominated in the uk in particular by university Kevin clubs for example um or you know just just official clubs um, and the figures that are winning those um and part of that really is to, to suggest that perhaps we need to look at things from a legislator, uh, from an interpreter's perspective, which which would be a perspective of my own, um, just a different taste, a different flavour of what Kevin might be like from this different perspective. 
So that gets us to this um, point of subterranean turn then. So I wondered at, at the start of this project, could I give this, uh, this new book, this new project a sociological standpoint? Could I move from that initial transition from being an urban explorer into, into being a caver? And as you look the part, so uh, that, that, the two photographs there is kind of like that transition point, I suppose. Um, now we get to the actual book itself. So there we go, it's real, it's there. Um, what I want to do now is tell you a little bit about what the contents is about um, and then hopefully knit the ideas together to, to give it a general purpose, uh, you know, what, what is the overview of that. So what I've tried to do throughout the chapters is, um, for me, break down what Caven's all about. The first part of the book, like I say, it's all about giving a bit of my background. So it's, it's very personal. It gives a good, um, it's very raw, I would say, as well. So it's about um, being really honest about my level of expertise at the beginning of the project and how we developed as a group um, throughout. Uh, and the first part of it really is getting to, 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 to know about the intimacy, I suppose, of caves. Um, and I break that down between two parts. This chapter is broken down into two parts. The first um, draws on Gaston Balchelard's um, Poetics of Space. So it starts to explore intimacy and how you can explore different hallways of the mind. Um, and this is where, you know, you suddenly have to overcome certain fears, you know, the panic that you get when you're on that first SRT pitch. And what you can do if you hang there long enough, if you're dangling in the air, you can change that mindset and you can become a little bit contemplative. You can suddenly feel protected by the walls around you um, and you just feel differently. You start to sense the cave in a very different manner, um, almost in, the, in that intimate way. The second part of the chapter um, is I explore this term scotopia, which is a concept I developed in a previous paper um, when I explored the Paris catacombs which is where you enter a space um, absent of or devoid of light. Um, and what that produces is uh, it, it sets your senses off, really. It starts to stimulate senses in different ways. And part of the argument is that we live in a, a very visual world where our set of the senses are often ignored. Um, so this is almost reinvigorating them in a, in a place where um, they're, they're actually needed, you know, um, because there's so little light there, you start to notice things in a different way. So what I do is try to explore, um, you know, what, what touch is like inside the cave. I try to explore what the smells are like, um, because I suppose it's only there that you notice what's, what mud really smells like when you crawl into it. Um, so part of the chapters, um, about, I borrow a guy called John Hull. Um, he's, a, he's a guy who went blind um, over, a court, over a period of time. And he describes his journey um, and what it's like to become a whole body seer, he calls it. Um, and I try to explore the idea of Scotopia being a little bit similar to that. So that chapter is the poetics of Caven. The next part is to explore this idea of fear. And it's the argument that we live in a world where um, people are becoming increasingly risk avoidant. Um, Ulrich Beck calls them risk societies. Um, and what my argument is, that, is that we should try to, to reconnect with fears when opportunities arise or present themselves. And going into caves is perhaps one of those ways in which we can do that. Um, now, initially, I looked at that concept, you know, Ling's favorite concept of um, edge work as a way to perhaps unpack that. But I had some key problems with that, I suppose. I don't, I don't feel like it fit quite well. And um, so part of the chapter is a little bit of a critique about that, just to suggest that um, perhaps it's not the ideal concept because what Ling does um, is really tries to minimize risk. So he mitigates it through these ideas of skill and mastery. Um, and that's that's not necessarily the point. Um, and the other idea is that um, he's only concerned with the positive attractions of risky situations. And what I found is that quite often caving is just not a pleasurable experience. Um, but equally, that becomes pleasurable. I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, and it just doesn't account for that. So what I needed was a different concept. And that moved me on to Michel Foucault's um, concept of limit experience. Um, and I liked it just because it draws attention really to unlivable experiences, things involving maximum intensity um, and also maximum impossibility at the same time. Um, and I just felt that it captured exactly what I was feeling in, in, in a much more um, detailed manner. So a lot of the chapters exploring the difference between the concepts um, and why limit experience is, is much more appropriate, I suppose, for exploring Caven. Um, the second from last chapter, so before we get to the conclusions, is all about survival strategies and how they're different in the surface world compared to the survival strategies in un underground in caves. Um, so it explores some of the classic strategies we use in the surface world on a daily basis, perhaps even without realizing it. Obviously, within that paradigm of, of consumer capitalism, 
Um, so whether that's focusing on, you know, physical beauty, um, focusing on our bodies and how we try to um, create create that idea that they don't age, uh, whether that's through athleticism and creating those hypermuscular figures or whether that's just through uh, thanatological pleasure. So television series is about death, you know, tourism about death, things that allow us to come to terms with it or turn it into enjoyment. So a lot of those are survival strategies that we perhaps have in the, in the surface world that don't work the same way uh, underground. And what you find is that you need different strategies to just control with the fear, the panic that you have under, under the ground. Um, and I come up with three different strategies that I feel arose in the time I was underground with the people I was with. Um, and whether that's um, the silence of others or the fact that other people have died down there and the fact that you're still living, you're still alive, gives you a little bit of sense that you know what you're doing, gives you a little bit of a sense that, um, you know, that you're perhaps a figure that should be there, whether that's true or not is another matter. Um, you also get a sense of group immortality, so a sense that if we draw on Bauman's idea of peg communities, this temporary formation of a community where you help each other out and you know, um, you're there to hold each other's ropes, you're there to um, carry your bits of equipment for one another, it creates that sense of, of community if it doesn't exist on the surface. And then that superhuman force where you just you're convinced that you're part of um, the knowledge, the expertise of cavers. Um, so you're part of that power knowledge body, whether you are or not, again, um, is, is another factor, but that's, that's something I try to explore in some detail. I'm sorry I'm rushing through this, so I'm just conscious of time. Um, so getting towards the end, the moment this all clicked, I didn't know how to connect all those chapters. I had all these chapters, all these different ideas, but I didn't know how to connect them all, how to join the dots in, in terms of a conclusion. And what happened was that I was on a bit of a, a break with my wife. We went to the Lake District. Um, it was a particularly stressful period, I suppose. I was trying to finish this book. Um, I wasn't quite sure how to finish it. So we went on a bit of a break. And we went on a, a bit of a walk to a place called Rydal Cave. And then it dawned on me, because I've dabbled in English literature a little bit, that there was a guy called Wordsworth, who was buried back in Grasmere, who wrote about this idea of the sublime. Um, and he talks a little bit about this idea of pleasure and displeasure um, and how we can often experience this weird blend of the two, but, you know, come away from it experiencing something valuable. And I thought, well, perhaps that's the thing that knits everything together. All of the chapters, that's an integral theme within them. So maybe I can bring that together into, into a, one final conclusion. So ultimately, that's what I did. And my argument throughout the book then is that uh, what we try to achieve when we go cave and when we go Seem to have lost Kevin momentarily. We'll wait for him to beam back in. Uh, you know, I've, I've never been in a cave where those feelings um, have, have not been present. They've always been there. Um, but equally, the pleasure's always been there, and that's probably why I've returned um, numerous times as well. Yeah, I mean, just to let you know that you you, you disappeared for about a minute. Um, oh, did I? Yeah, I, I'm happy to give you that minute back, but just, just oh, yeah. so that you know, anything profound that you said in the last 60 seconds has been lost to the world. So you yeah, might want to say uh, it again. That was the conclusion part as well. That was the important part. Okay. Um, we also have the slides. I lost the, the share screen is lost too, yeah? I am, I'm back on the art of sublimation then. So um, I'll just quickly recap that last bit because that's probably an important part. We, we've um, not got your slides. Is that is that important or...? No, I can just talk about it. That's fine. Um, I can try and put them back up to be honest. See if that works. Uh, just bear with us. Someone's just helpfully put in the chat that we lost you at Wordsworth. At Wordsworth. I think they okay. mean we lost they lost the audio, not that we couldn't follow you anymore. <laughs> I'm a back. Yeah, you're back. Yeah, perfect. So, Wordsworth, yeah, um, I was there, I thought sublime, okay, he comes up with that concept of the sublime, um, and that got me thinking a little bit about, right, um, uh, I need to deal with this idea of intense pleasure, intense displeasure, because that's that's what the sublime is all about, 
Um, and one of the best scholars who's discussed that is Jean-Francois Lyotard. Uh, he discusses the idea of the different, which is the precursor to the sublime feeling. Um, it's the thing that's not presentable under the rules of knowledge. You know, it's not describable. It's something that's incredibly difficult to fathom. But he argues that once you find it, you know you found this sublime feeling. And I was thinking perhaps that's what I've been experiencing the entire time I've been in, inside the cave. And perhaps that's the time, that's why I return to these places. Um, because every time I do return, I get that intense feeling of terror at some point. I get that intense feeling of fear. But equally, you get an intense feeling of pleasure at the same time, a weird pleasure. Um, and it's the merging of the two, I think, that brings you back, which is perhaps um, the ability to negotiate that art of sublimation that, that is, for me, from a sociological point of view, um, why Caven's important, I suppose. So really what the book is, it's a guide to the art of sublimation. It's essentially a guide and each chapter takes you through different versions of how Caven can um, bring you to that sublime feeling. Um, and it suspends you in each chapter, I suppose, between the fullest emotional forces of terror um, pain and pleasure um, and for me that's that's exactly what what Kevin's about and that should bring us to the end um, do we have any questions that's great thank you Kevin yeah uh, questions do we have any questions I'll let I'll give people a chance to load up some questions in the in the chat um, do you think your journey into caving coming out of urbex you, you were implying that you're you feel you're different now oh yeah definitely i think uh more sensible to be honest uh the urbex days were probably uh sometimes you're a bit gung-ho but you know you do some stupid things you go in coal mines for incidents uh you know you don't always take the correct number of torches um i think you do you do learn different things particularly you know when you start to employ a lot of the uh the, the climbing stuff that we've learned in the past a lot of the safety um i would say that that's changed massively um changes your perspective of the underground as well i think um because it's very different to explore in the underground places that are and you know they're not natural but they're made by humans you you always know there's a way out you always know there's a structure to it Whereas caves, it's not the same. Um, it, it's very different, you know. There's there's no predictability about it, which which I like. Um, but then you have to be prepared for that, I suppose. And do you see that as a, a sort of personal journey? Because you're a very non-judgmental person. If I can sort of put you into a, into a pigeonhole, I'm just wondering whether it's altered your view of urbex or you just see it that everybody grows through life and you have you have your exciting phase and then you have your more skillful phase because yeah. you learn as you get older i don't know you've, you've not re renounced your former self you're just no longer your former self Is that yeah right? i think it's like you said in the past you know about urban exploration i think the novelty wears off eventually i think once you've done it enough um i don't know just something disappears from it um, certain elements don't. I've, I've always been interested in mines, and I don't think that'll go away. But that all, that still has that sense of mystery to it. Um, I think I think you're probably right as well. There's perhaps that sense of um, you almost gain that skill and mastery that I was talking about a little bit earlier, um, which, which you don't necessarily need when you do an urbex. I know you can take the photography in different directions, but um, it's just just very very different, I suppose. Great, thanks for that. I'm, I'm I'm not distracted. I'm just trying to look at the chat. Oh, to that's synthesize fine. a question. Um, what one person's put a comment to say that they think caving is a cat to pleasure, and I don't know whether they or or or, or whether that has any resonance with you. I'm not sure what the categories are that are being referred to there. Does that mean anything for you? Cat I don't two? know how many categories we have. Um... Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it, it suggests it's not quite cat one, but um, <laughs> there we go. Uh, I think you're getting a lot of agreement from people about the pleasure pain interlock. Um, there's a there's a weird French word, isn't there? Jusos or or something that is pleasure pain interconnect, which which you may also be uh, channeling there. Uh, can't remember whose, whose work that was. Um, oh, there's Kate. There's a question here. I'm going to read it out. It's from Jim. So Tristan Garcia argues that quote. Our appetite for new thrills is leaving us indifferent to the values of subtlety and compromise. I always worried about this with phenomenological studies such as this. Do cavers not end up reinforcing the allure of pleasure over reflection? By which I think he means, i.e. just creating a new 21st century or capitalism or, or channeling a, a, a pleasure-seeking commodification of, of thrill 
Uh, that's my bit that I just bolted on the end of Jim's question. Yeah. I think that's what it means. Um, I would say that, yeah, there, there is the kind of danger of that, I suppose. Um, I would say that um, you could end up... At, the, the thing with caving is, well, I think there's... Um, it puts a lot of people off, you know, especially it almost put us off. And it has put a lot of the people that I first went caving with off. They've not gone back and done it again. Um, it's just could be just a terrifying place to go in. So it just doesn't doesn't commodify in the same way that other things do. Um, it's it's just so unpredictable, it's so different to anything that I've ever experienced. Um, I, I just don't think it fits into similar categories, which is why, again, for me, that's one of the allures. That's what brings me back to it. Um so I don't think it can fully kind of reinforce that, no. Your, your book title emphasises the word natural. Yeah. What, 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 are, you, what are you channeling there? Why, why making that distinction so boldly in the title? What, what, what do you want us to take away from it, that? Uh, to make that clear distinction between that old urbex world that I was exploring in the first book and this new world um, that is, it is natural, it's not been created by human beings. Um, and to emphasize the difference between those two realities, really, because you can compare the two books and the two perspectives in, and I think they're starkly different. Um, and I suppose you could treat them like that. Mm. What's book number three going to be about? Um, uh, I got, I got, it's a secret, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. It's out of space, I reckon. It could be. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Colleagues in the call, I can't, I can't see any other questions in the, in the thing, but apologies if, if I've missed them. But um, thank you uh, once again, um, Kevin, for for, for, for for another sort of deep dive. You 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 meld the theory and the practice in, in again in a unique way to you, which is always a joy to um, to, to hear and experience. You, you can't separate that embodied stuff from the, the the mind stuff that's going on at the same time. It's really 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 interesting mix. Um, so thank, thank you. you. Um, and so you. our third presenter is Maria, beaming in from West Virginia, where it's sunny. Hi. Do you mind if I just make a comment on Kevin's That's book and presentation? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just want to say, um, I think Kevin, just a big plug. I think the, the book is awesome. Um, absolutely right that there is a lot of this policing of boundaries of what constitutes a caver or a speleologist. And a lot of caving societies around the world are very elitist and very excluding for those reasons. You know, the, the issue about whether it's science or adventure often plays out in different ways in different national contexts and different moments in history. And he gets it right on. Um, and I think part of what's super cool about um, Kevin's book is that that it is total, it's a total unabashed exploration of the range, the full, fuller range of experience, of human experience that is possible. Um, even a little bit of the impossible within cave systems. And I just think it's it's really freeing, it's exciting. And it really captures some of that initial excitement that a lot of these older adventure narratives had. You know, we critique them, we understand their trouble. But all in all, I've had cavers say, you know what? There is something really special about that kind of writing, it, especially children, younger people are connected to a particular kind of experience. And we're losing that if we go to the really cold, boring scientific writing. And um, anyway, I just think it's a great book. Uh, plug for Kevin's book. Buy it. Read it. It's really, really good. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. I really appreciate that. Um, yeah. I just want to add on the back of that as well. A lot of your work was very influential in, in, in directing and channeling the book. So um, a lot of your work's in the background of there as well. Oh, thank That's you. Super cool. I really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. So I guess I can now officially um, start. Uh, give me one second to open up my slides and then I'll start the timer. Okay. I'm exactly on 20 minutes. All right. Let okay. me open up no the problem. screen. Um, and here we are. Um, so let me know. You should be able to see just yeah, my Yeah, we've got your presentation um, appropriately on the screen. Lovely. Got it all good. All right. So let me go ahead and put in my mode. I had it ready to go. And I'll go ahead and start. Well, um, thank you, everyone. Really appreciate uh, Luke's invitation. I've known Luke, Luke for... for uh, for many years, this is really great um, to be back. So the, the title of my talk is uh, From Caves to Karsten Back, 
reassessing what it means to study the underground in Venezuela, Cuba, and Puerto Rico. Apologies, really, there's no time for Cuba today, <laughs> although I have a couple of pictures from Cuba. I'm mostly going to talk a little bit about Venezuela, but I'm going to spend most of my time in Puerto Rico, where I'm mostly doing my, my, my research. And in fact, I'm, I'm about to fly to Puerto Rico in less than two weeks' time. Um, I'm an associate professor of geography at, at West Virginia University. I have three affiliations I always like to share. These are my teachers, my friends, my mentors. I am a fellow of the National Speleological Society here in the U.S., um, an honorary member of the Sociedad Venezolana de Speleología, and also honorary member of the Cuban caving group, Grupo Origen. My dear friends, um, I thank them for, for all their support. So, of course, we've just been talking about caves. Um, we're going to start there again today. Um, this picture actually is in Cuba in an undisclosed location um, by, a, by a, a photographer who is actually an alumnus of WVU, an extraordinary uh, uh, explorer and photographer, Ryan Marr. Uh, he went down to Cuba with us and he's just a great friend. So I love this definition, right? Mysterious and inspiring caves are found around the world and even throughout much of our solar system. Caves are naturally occurring hollow spaces in the ground, large enough for a person to enter. And that, hence the fact that caves by definition are an exploratory concept, right? So it's completely perfect and apropos to talk about caves in a series of sessions on exploration. Caves have rooms or passages to explore. They hold the key to understanding past, present, future, and life beyond the planet. Um, but I'm now going to define a term that perhaps uh, most of you have not heard or, or maybe heard less of, right? So that term is, is karst, and I'm going to take this definition out of this great um, uh, uh, document that actually is av available free on the internet. Um, so simply speaking, karst is a type of landscape. It is formed by water. Um, dissolving certain types of rocks, creating features in this landscape, such as caves and sinkholes, right? Um, here's kind of like a diagram. Sorry, I'm getting a little bookish here with a little bit of geology, right? But um, so, but, but what's really important here is that karst, when we think about karst and, and caves within the broader car, uh, karst context, we're really talking about these systems that have both surficial and, and subsurface features and a lot of interconnections and a lot of um, manifestations in the landscape that actually really challenge Challenge the dichotomy between what's above ground and below ground. So that's a really important point. I'm going to kind of like build on a little later in the talk today. Um, you know, and something super important: water is critical to the system. You have water raining on on land. You know, the water gets a little acidic from like the roots of trees and vegetation. That mild acidity actually contributes to water's capacity to dissolve relatively soluble rock like limestone, marble, gypsum, so on, and then that forms cat that forms caverns, right? And also aqua. And so, so um, thinking about karst really has us thinking about all of these systems and all of these processes together. And I think that's a really important thing to think about and also has really important implications in terms of how we think in, in, of the social science and the humanities um, when we think about the underground, right? Um, so just to, uh, I did, this is like my second picture from Cuba, okay? So this is the famous uh, Valley of Viñales, uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This is what like a classic karst landscape looks like from, from above, right? These mogotes, these mountains, many of these mountains are getting crisscrossed with a bunch of caves. It's a beautiful landscape. There's a lot of karst in the world, but actually the number of people who depend on karst systems in terms of access to fresh groundwater is much more than those who live on karst. So when people around the world try to really emphasize the importance of identifying and conserving karst, usually they talk about freshwater resources as a key hook to get people like, oh shit, yeah, I, I guess we really should care about karst, right? Um, hey, don't build your Corvette museum on top of a big sinkhole. It's like usually a bad idea, especially when the sinkhole collapses. This actually happened in the US of A. Lots of things happen in the US of A, but I'll just move on. Um, I will say that there was a recent um, effort around the, the world to group together cavers, car scientists, environmentalists to raise the awareness of caves and cars. And actually the new leadership of the International Union of Speleology, she now talks about karst and caves to really elevate the role of the systemic connection that caves has to uh, the rest of the environment. Um, so if you want to learn more about that effort, you can see the QR code here. 
Um, and uh, this is, of course, an ongoing effort. And then this presentation is part, part of that work. Um, so, but my personal story, connecting caves to cars begins with family. So I'm a cultural anthropologist. I geek out on kinship and uh, how better way to do it than to connect it to my personal kin story. So here I am when I, when I was about five years of age, I'm um, exploring a cave with family um, in the outskirts of Caracas, Venezuela, where I am from. And uh, before I was born, my father on the left um, joined the Venezuelan Speleological Society. The, one of the founders was my godfather, the guy on the right, Juan Antonio Tronchoni. And uh, there was their school symbol of, of, their, of their group. Um, plenty of those debates about who all or could not be part of them, Kevin. They were like, oh, you're, you're a speleista, a speleista. You're only an adventurer. You don't fit here. And then my, my godfather, actually, before he died, he actually ended up telling me, I regret the fact that we shunned the adventurers. Because, and he even said, like, didn't we all originally start caving because we just love the adventure, right? But anyway, um, I talk a little bit about that in my work. But this was such what one of these organizations really focused on the science of speleology. Um, and part of its origin story was this really cool cave in northeastern Venezuela called Huachero Cave a place that I finally got to visit um, in 2007. Um, a really kind of cool story here is that um, when this cave became a national monument in, uh, I think it's 1940, 40, by 1949, it was already a national monument. Um, it still did not have a complete full map of it. And um, in 1968, the Venezuelan Speleological Society organized like this 30 day expedition. In fact, the two guys that participated in it um, stayed in the cave for 30 days. One of those men was my father, the guy on the right there, like looking over his, his map. And um, he was a medical student at the time. So he was gonna study the physiological impacts of 30 you know, day isolation in caves the kinds of experiments that were actually really popular around the US around in the US and in Europe at the time and uh, he had fallen in love with a fellow medical student she visited him in this cave during his 30 day ordeal and i wish i could say i was conceived in the cave it really would have been perfect for this story but I, alas i wasn't i tried the math it doesn't quite work out but regardless Mat caves and mud and, you know, carbide all are part of my origin story as well. Um, but again, it wasn't until later that I really started to go from caves to karst. And that began with an expedition that I joined with my father in 2002 with this society back in Venezuela. By then, we had already emigrated to the United States in, 2000, in 1991. And actually, in this photo, we're back in that region near Guachero Cave in eastern Venezuela. Lots of karst. Lots of kind of like these mogote-like, um, uh, um, you know, topography. And I really got to appreciate how um, the story of caving, at least for in my perspective, can't just be about the cave in the cave, but how do you get to the cave? And then how do you even find the damn cave? So it turns out that a lot of cavers around the world have learned to understand the importance of karst, right? To be able to identify areas of potential cave formation, right? So where do rivers run and then disappear and then come back out? Aha, you see that in a topographic map. And you have a really good cue that there might be some caves in the area. Um, LIDAR has been a, a game changer for this around the world. I mean, it really helps you understand and read the topography of the earth in ways that we couldn't before. So really understanding this issue of karst and the broader geomorphology of the appearance and of caves turns out to be a really, really important speleological story, but also a sociological one, right? At least from my perspective. So, I mean, I, the idea of preparing for exploration, how many days are you are you walking in the mountains, finding it? Who's helping you find these caves? You know, oftentimes you have indigenous communities or or, or, or locals living in the mountains who actually know where things are. Um, just, just to get to and back to the cave turned out to be a really important story that I wanted to tell. So when I went back to my grad program, and I, and I presented the, the proposal of my project, 
I really had to, of course, think about not just caves, but also caves and karst, right? So if we we're going to use the concept of, of living culturally, right? And I, I just love this definition um, that I always share with my students and I will share with you here. You know, this idea of if, we, if we're going to try to understand how we live culturally, right? An approach that encourages studies of people whose lives take them on a journey through space and time in environments which seem to them to be full of significance, who use words and material artifacts to get things done and communicate with others. And I love this. And who in their talk endlessly spin metaphors so as to weave labyrinthine and ever expanding networks of symbolic equivalence. I know it's a mouthful, but I just love this definition by Tim Ingold. Um, to really capture that, to really capture that, I had to go beyond the context of like, oh, different geographies of speleology or like labs or people's homes or where are they keeping the archives and where are they, you know, preparing their expeditions to also really learn and understand the environments and systems and processes involved in the formation of caves in the first place. Um, I should say that I'm gonna be referencing a few papers and a few ideas in today's talk. And I actually created a QR code that will take you to a Google folder where I've put a bunch of PDFs. <laughs> and I'll probably put some more um, by the end of today's session, it's just in the spirit of, of sharing uh, great stuff. Um, and most of most of the stuff I share are, are papers that have really engaged with this notion of karst that I think is really helpful. Um, and um, yeah, I have some of my work too is there as well. Um, if you guys want to check out some of my readings. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be sharing some some where I'm at with my insights, thinking about karst. Um, this is mostly from my work in Puerto Rico that is helping me rethink caves, the underground, and also the people dedicated to its exploration, study, and conservation. And with that, we're headed to Puerto Rico. So um, just a little bit of a make, get everybody on the same page. So in Puerto Rico is an incorporated uh, territory of the United States. It's basically a colony, okay? Um, and yet Puerto Ricans are US citizens, but they have a really distinct and strong sense of national identity. Um, and, and I guess closer to our concerns, the issue of territoriality and hence speleological sovereignty um, is a really complex one, really complex one. Um, this is work that is ongoing. I'm only going to share a couple of ideas on some themes today. Um, I do have to do a shout out to La Doctora Aixa Aleman Diaz from the American, American Geophysical Union. She's a fellow anthropologist and dear, dear friend. We just got two really huge big grants to do work in Puerto Rico. We're super excited. Um, I also have to do a shout out to Mike Lace, good friend from many, many years. One of these cavers who does not follow the trappings of academia is kind of like drawn to his interests and does incredible work. Um, Mike uh, has been trying traveling to the Caribbean to, to survey um, and, and, and help with the conservation of coastal karst all over the Caribbean for over 30 years. We're actually meeting in Puerto Rico in less than two weeks. And I also a huge shout out to my friends Tamara, in fact, Tamara is here in this uh, Zoom call, Tamara Gonzalez and Manuel Rivas from the Comunidad Espeleológica Puerto Riqueña. They're actually the two guys here. This is another friend from Puerto Rico, our dear friend Mildred, a lot of really active cavers in Puerto Rico. And just a huge shout out for what I think is one of the best podcasts out there. And this is a podcast, sorry, it is in Spanish if you don't speak Spanish, um, but it is it's a podcast that really explores all of these dimensions of caves and cars in Puerto Rico from this really broad perspective, right? Um, just a wonderful podcast. Maybe they can put out transcripts and, and, and maybe translate them for, for those, those poor folks that, that don't speak Spanish. Anyway, just a shout out. I do a lot of caving in, in Puerto Rico uh, with Tamara and Manuel, just really good friends and spectacular teachers. Um, so on to the cars of the Caribbean, and I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. It's almost Halloween. This picture will probably get my kids to see the recording later, only because I'll promise them that there's pirates, except as Mike would tell me, honey, you're on the wrong tour if you're thinking you're going to see pirates in the Caribbean with my caving. So there's that. Hopefully this will get my kids to watch the, the video. Really what I'm going to be talking more about is really I'm learning with Mike and others about the geomorphology of karst landforms in, in, uh, in Puerto Rico and the rest of the Caribbean here, a QR code to the book. 
Um, I mean, there are places in the Caribbean where, for example, Jamaica, it's like 80% karst. Cuba, 67% karst. Uh, Puerto Rico, 37%. And you think about it, it's kind of cool to think about karst in the context of islands and archipelagos. It really brings up this really vertical dimension, not just the underground, but connecting the underground to surficial processes and climate, right? So there's this really expansive vertical and also voluminous dimension that karst invites when we think about these places that are oftentimes somehow diminished because they're somehow small and somehow in insignificant. It's just complete ridiculousness. But anyway, karst, in my view, really helps like kind of like flip that idea of size and, and importance, all right? Um, a few of the next pictures are gonna be just to give you a sense of the extraordinary diversity of the manifestations of superficial karst and also on superficial uh, un, or uh, underground karst in all over Puerto Rico, just to give you a sense, right? I'm just gonna go through some of these pictures. Um, all of this explored and, and surveyed and studied um, with either Tamara, uh, Mike, and, and other friends from Puerto Rico. Yes, you have plenty of the squirmy, dirty, you know, dark and claustrophobic spaces that many of us have been talking about, right? Plenty of fear here, fear here. I am a total wuss. In the team here, Tamara is really the the really the really brave one. I wait for Tamara to check things out and then I proceed. Um, but then there's also these amazing spaces that have all this light and then this twilight. And then the twilight changes with the time of day. So then it brings us in the sun and the moon, right? Features in the broader landscape that clearly we know from archeological work were really significant in terms of how our ancestors really valued and inhabited these spaces, right? Um, and you have plenty of caves that had collapsed roofs, kind of like that Corvette Museum, right? You have a collapse. And then now you have places for roots and vegetation to grow, right? So this is also, so, and Mike is like, we, we map it all, we map it all because we really have to understand and in some ways almost honor all of the sizes and manifestations of, of karst, regardless of whether or not they look like our prototypical caves in our in our minds, right? Um, so, so walking along the coast with Mike is, is always a fun experience. Um, I was like, hey man, come on, a little bit of a beach time. He's like, no, honey, wrong tour again. I'm like, ah, damn. So, but but really to get back to it, a lot of karst features along the coast of Puerto Rico that have really, in my mind, completely transformed the way I think about coasts. It just completely blown my mind. And you have caves right in the coastline. Um, yes, we map, we map all the time. Here's Tamara mapping in a place that has really important rock art. Um, and likely it's possible that at some point, maybe when ancestors were present um, doing rock art, maybe this looked completely different because these places change. There are ongoing processes changing these places, right? Um, so so that under, this is a different kind of history, right? Kind of like earthly history that we're, we're uncovering through our exploration. We're always mapping, it's always a collaborative effort. And I should mention that one of the big problems that we have in Puerto Rico and also in many coastal places in, in the Caribbean is that a lot of this coastal karst is being threatened by development. Mind you, illegal development. Um, this, this is a tourist site um, built in Western uh, Puerto Rico. These young people in the right-hand corner contacted us so that we could help them map and document the, 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 the cave below the structure so that they can really push um, to really uh, hold these uh, people accountable for what they're doing and putting the co coastal karst uh, in jeopardy. A lot of karst features are above ground. Here it is, La Piaz, okay? This is above ground, right? Uh, but not far from there, there's caves. Now, this is a real good one. So we're driving on this highway and Mike is like, I bet you there's a cave there. This is like this little mogote. It doesn't even look like much anything. Um, and uh, sure enough, we park our car, we found our way there and we asked um, the owner of the land to give us permission to go up there and there's a cave and there's rock art and there's um, archaeological artifacts. So, I mean, it's just really fascinating to, to be working in these different projects because the little spaces, the little dinky spaces, many of which don't even have full dark zones, the kinds of spa spaces that honestly are mostly ignored 
by most cavers looking for the really intense adventure experience. These places are also full of information and, and insight. And frankly, at least for me, also a particular kind of experience with the landscape that I would have missed otherwise. But the big one that has recently blown my mind is the fact that you have sand dunes formed by sand that has flown over the Atlantic <laughs> with winds accumulating the sands in the northern coast, of, at least in the case of Puerto Rico, they collect, they petrify, and sometimes you have karst processes forming caves within. So another example of something that just blows my mind in terms of the diversity of karst features. So here we are mapping a cave, uh, what probably at one point was a cave, right? But then you have a collapse and then you have like an exposed, now what looks like kind of like a rock shelter, um, but we map it. We map it. Now, what's getting really wild um, with Mike and, and some of our friends in Puerto Rico is that, you know, we know we do archaeology. We're also really interested in looking at, say, ship graffiti and like old construction sites. And something's happening to me where I'm starting to like oscillate between, say, for example, the concrete or or the, you know, the materials of old foundations of old buildings formed with limestone crushed from quarries that probably brought down mogotas and caves and reconfigured here. So this is of course themes that people who have dealt with ruins and bunkers have engaged with very well. And then I'm thinking like, oh my God, like this is kind of like similar to the stuff I'm seeing in the coast. It's just like really blowing my mind. Um, I know I'm, a, I'm already at 21 minutes, so probably about one more minute, two more minutes and I'll be done, I'll be done. Okay, so let me give you an example of what this is doing to my mind. <laughs> to my brain. Um, there's a particular case study that we're following in Puerto Rico, and this is an NGO that for 25 years has embraced this karst sensibility. It's called Ciudadanos del Carso, or Citizens of Karst, and they are in the process of building, of creating the Instituto del Carso de Puerto Rico y en Caribe, and it's going to have Puerto Rico's first natural history museum. Um, this is what the building looks like. It's actually, and it used to be an old school, a whole other story in the context of Puerto Rico, but I'm not going to get into it. And I've visited the school over the years to see the process of transformation of the building. And I'm going through this building. And you know what I'm thinking about? I'm thinking about those caves, those karst features all over the coastal landscape of Puerto Rico. It's really hard for me to like separate them. All of a sudden, the built and unbuilt environment, the distinction becomes so arbitrary. Um, I mean, look at the look at these look at this structure, right? Um, and the kicker is that the building might actually be located on a petrified dune that might have a cave beneath, except there's no known entrance, at least not so far. <laughs> so, I mean, and this is how crazy I'm getting. This is my daughter in the famous Oculus in the new uh, metro uh, of New York City. Um, and is she above or below ground? I mean, and it's called the Oculus. I mean, how perfect is that, right? A round or eye-like opening or design, such as a circular window or an opening at the apex of a dome. The kind of thing I'm seeing all over the karst landscape of Puerto Rico. So a few implications to conclude. What, where am I here? Where am I here? And what is some of the, the appeal that I'm making to you? We got to move away from context and distributed the geographies to that, plus the processes of formation, transformation, destruction, and creation of the materials of our landscape, right? Whether below or above ground and everything in between. So Engel talks a lot about not just an ontological view, but an ontogenic view of things. True, not only for living beings, but also for the environment. Again, whether built or not in all in between. And thinking about karst processes is a way to think about these places as having a life of their own within a particular kind of timeline. Also talk of materiality is a good start, but it can't just end there. Really, we need to pay attention to materials and their qualities and processes. Engled has made a similar argument in different contexts. I'd say the same is true for the underground. The same is true for the underground. Engle has a few things. Sorry, I'm kind of like really Engoldian right now because I just finished reading Tim Engle's last book and it just takes me like three months to like come down of my Engle, of my Engle cloud. But anyway, he's got some ideas about this too. Um, there's this really awesome theoretical um, uh, 
archaeologist. His name is Dimitri Mlekus. And he talks about like folds, but folds don't really work for me anymore. Um, I rather think about like thresholds and really just pay attention to how these materials have changed over time and what are the processes of formation and transformation. Um, so yeah, caves gather, their puntos de encuentro, as Tamara has said, but they also amplify but part of our capacity to appreciate the power of the underground to amplify and make connections requires us to understand their processes of transformation and formation over time. Hence the need to really think about karst. Um, and yeah, mix up the tours, go to different kinds of spaces and that's it. Sorry guys, I am a couple of minutes over. And that's it, that's, thanks. That's, that's great Maria, thanks very much. And um, once again, a very, Again, I don't mean this sarcastically, I mean it positively, a very enthusiastic presentation that, that brings a lot of energy and warmth to, to, to the topic. And what's really interesting is the way in which you emphasise the role of kinship. Uh, and then you go on into the idea that we need to reconfigure the way in which we look at caves in the sense that it reminds me of those optical illusions whereby is it the old, is it, is it an old hag or is it a young woman yeah. Escher. it all Escher. depends on how you see the yeah. dark and the light and right. what you're trying to i think orientate us towards thinking about is don't just focus on the void spaces focus on the mass and the the the, the amazingness of the mass and its formation the cast formation that creates the holes, the non-holes, the non-holes are as, are as important as the holes. Yes. And I think that's a really sort of refreshing sort of challenge for us to think, you know, it, it's about the totality and it's about the change of that of that mass over time. And that mass is bigger than us, but, but also we live with that mass and we are made by our relationships and our dependencies upon that mass. So thank yes, you for- Thank you, thank you. Giving us that. Um, provocation um so i'm looking to see whether there are any questions coming through in the chat um i had one question that was brewing in my mind and i was thinking is this a really old old boring white male question and, and, and again I'll, I'll just ask it but i don't mean it in a disrespectful way but when you go caving now compared to when you went caving before you had kids and a family life is there any change in terms of the way in which you think about that? Is your tolerance of risk lower or because it was always a family pastime when you were growing up? Did you never have a sort of juncture moment? I, I know this question is often asked of female rock climbers, but it's not asked of male rock climbers, which is why I'm very cautious and unsure about whether it's even permissible to ask the question these days. But hey, I've asked Kevin about his biographical journey into later than first adulthood, whatever we call. Yes, no, of Kevin. course. I, it's totally valid question. And the answer is absolutely my, my capacity. Listen, I've always, I've never been, I'm not brave. I've never been brave, <laughs> but it just so happens that I'm very trusting I'm very trusting of people who appear to know what they're doing. Okay. This is for better or worse. <laughs> so, you know, you know, we've already talked about the importance of going with people who know what they're doing, not to go alone. I mean, I, 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 I've never caved and I will never cave alone ever, ever. I mean, it's kind of like a rule of thumb here. Like you don't want to cave alone. Um, but, um, so I've been very trusting in following people who I admire and who I care about and respect, and I'll go to really crazy places with them, but I'm usually biting my tongue cause I'm scared shitless, but actually, um, it is true that after I've had these three kids and when I have time away from them absolutely um yeah I think of them I think of like whether or not what I'm doing is kind of foolish um but which is why being with Mike is perfect because it's all about these little caves <laughs> it's like they fit they're the perfect size for me very little like full-on dark zones yeah you have to deal with the, the cock and you know the 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 there's a lot of cockroaches okay I, there in so many places okay but that that's really much as hard as bad as, as bad as it gets i mean i joke but um yeah i'm more careful um i will say i'm actually working on a paper that takes this issue of kinship and and um separation from others to a whole other level but i'll leave that for when the paper is published and it's going to be a really fun provocation just wait for it 
Okay, well, we'll all look forward to that. Uh, I've got a question that's come in from uh, Jim. Uh, do you think caving is perceived differently between Puerto Rico and, say, the US or the UK? Does it take on a broader cultural significance? Yes. So um, it's a complex. So I've, you know, I've done some work in like on like caver communities and organizations in Venezuela, Cuba, the US. It's actually a really complex answer. There's just a lot of there's a range. Part of what Kevin has talked about this idea that you know there's this tension between the sporting science, the science. Are you serious? Not serious? Are you like an adventure or not? These tensions play out in different ways and express themselves at different ranges, ranges within different national contexts. I'll just leave it there. Um, it's a really interesting issue. I, in my experience in the U.S., it's interesting in my experiences with Venezuelan cavers and Cuban cavers, at least historically, the notion of speleology as a science has been a bigger issue than even in the U.S. I mean, I've talked to a lot of cavers in, in the U.S. where they're like, oh, speleology, that just seems really kind of affected. They're, maybe they're more along the, con along the continuum of science and adventure. They're probably a little more forgiving and more open to like just th the joy of exploration and adventure. So long, of course, there's conservation and you're not doing something stupid, right? I mean, there is kind of like that difference between like, you know, you see these bumper stickers that say like cavers rescue spelunkers. So spelunkers meaning somebody who goes in like without a map, not knowing what they're doing with like flip flops and like one light, right? Like, um, so there's a, this, this hierarchy in terms of skill, right? But it just really plays out in different ways. I'm happy to talk to you about it in a different context because I could, I could go on for three hours. Okay. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks, Maria. That's great. The final question was, have you dated the cave art you've encountered? So not me personally, but we collaborate with um, cave, arche I mean, archaeologists in Puerto Rico, in fact, there has, there's been these really cool collaborations um, between one of the most prominent um, cave archaeologists in, in Puerto Rico, actually just an archaeologist of the Caribbean. His name is Reniel Rodriguez, a big shout out to Reniel Rodriguez from uh, University of Puerto Rico. Um, Utual. Um, he is he's publishing along with the support and collaboration of both international and uh, Puerto Rican cavers. A lot of dating um, and I what I'll do I mean I'll, there's actually a really great uh, proceedings paper that was just uh, presented last year in the International Union of Speleology on some of the latest dates of cave art in Puerto Rico I'm going to put it in that Google folder for you because I'm going to say numbers and I'm going to screw it up and I'm going to say the wrong thing but there's amazing really interesting work being done and again I just have to emphasize always always it requires cavers who know the landscape who can explore it and who can map it and they are really key support support for these kinds of scientists trying to do their work. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. We're going to move on now to our final presenter, uh, which is a recorded presentation. Uh, and it's from uh, Greg Brick, who is a geologist by background, and he's associated or affiliated with the University of Minnesota. Uh, so I'm going to play that, pre play that presentation for you. And it's about 18, 19 minutes long, I think. And then we'll have a a wrap up session with uh, a few questions. So uh, just bear with me while I set that up. Okay, so um, hopefully you can see a title slide on the screen, uh, Situationism in the Sewers. Um, if if you can't see that, could somebody please shout out who has got uh, voice uh, voice activation? But otherwise, I'm going to assume that you can see that. So that's great. Um, and I'm just going to play it now. Uh... Hello, my name is Greg Brick. Uh, I'd like to thank Luke Bennett for the invite to speak at Sheffield Space and Place Group. Um, the title of my talk is Situationism in the Sewers. Urban caving versus urban exploration. Um, and I'm using this distinction uh, between urban caving and urban exploration to help um, avoid some uh, confusion that to me seems to have arisen um, in discussions of urban exploration. Now, urban caving is a phrase that I used in print as early as 1992. I don't know if that was like the first uh, or not, uh, but that was published in the National Speleological Society News in the USA. 
Um, it was not really, it didn't really gain wide currency. I mean, I, it's like I was the only person using it anyway. Um, it seems that, you know, most people who are, but all the people that I, I know who uh, are engaged in urban exploration, um, they just, you know, and uh, of you know, exploring caves and tunnels, they just call it urban exploration. Uh, some background on myself, uh, so you can you know, help understand uh, my message uh, with this talk. My academic background is in geology. Um, I began caving in 1988, um, and that culminated in my 2009 book, Subterranean Twin Cities. And you can see on the screen here is a, the, uh, the publisher, University of Minnesota Press, which publishes many postmodern titles, as I'm sure you're aware. Uh, they did a um, you know, really nice uh, bus stop campaign, uh, these these bus waiting stations all over the cities. Um, and yeah, I should actually explain here, um, the Twin Cities we're talking about are Minneapolis, St. Paul area, the capital region of the state of Minnesota uh, in the US. Now, the geology of the Twin Cities is locally known um, before uh, the St. Peter sandstone bedrock underneath. Um, it's, uh, it's a very light and crumbly sort of rock. Uh, it's easy to excavate uh, and to the extent that uh, when the tunneling began in the Twin Cities, uh, it would, there was far more of it actually than it was necessary because it was just so easy to do. <laughs> so why not, you know? Um, it kind of reminds me of the, you know, my experience of it kind of reminds me of the pictures of the Nottingham Caves uh, in the UK in the Nottingham Sandstone where, you know, elaborate carvings have been made. You know, we get that same sort of thing uh, with this sandstone, uh, except for this distinction, um, ours, all of the caves around here are, were not, uh, carved out by the Druids, like the ones in Nottingham. We, we did not, you know, did, did not have that, that kind of, uh, you know, distinction. Um, so with this layer, um, the, the St. Peter sandstone layer um, and all these extra tunnels, the urban exploration around here, a lot of it focuses on underground um, activities. And, and no one around here would consider themselves a complete urban explorer unless, you know, they had gone down the tunnel systems and so on. I know in a lot of areas, it's more focused on <clears throat> industrial ruins. And, you know, we have our share of those like the, you know, many grain elevators. That seems to be a big thing. People like to climb around um, in those. So I began caving in the uh, pre-internet age, <clears throat> not to date myself here, but, um, and, you know, apart from stray newspaper clippings here and there, um, talking about people going in caves and tunnels under the cities. It was just, I didn't know, I didn't know anyone, um, apart from my, me and my friends who were doing anything like this. <clears throat> uh, but then Web 2.0 came along um, in the uh, mid to late 1990s, and Urbex websites began to appear and proliferate. Okay. And the Twin Cities caves and tunnels became flooded with newbies. There's all kinds of uh, new people every day, which continues to the present day. And um, this is just the, uh, you know, places that um, I began to notice changes such that, <clears throat> such as that, you know, places like utility tunnels that you, <clears throat> you could walk through now, 
the authorities were noticing all this activity and they would install there were you know you'd start encountering motion activated alarms all over the place um so that was you know a big downside of the, all this extra traffic um coming through the caves um i i initially i joined the internet forums uh when they appeared uh, around about the year 2000 but I must confess, I was put off um, by the extreme rudeness and schoolyard bullying type behavior um, that I encountered um, on these forums. And I quit them and I, I've never been a part of them uh, since then. But, you know, there were people, there were pushy people on there um, who would demand cave locations or how, how to get into a certain tunnel or something like that. And then uh, if you didn't provide that information, um, they would call you names, frequently beginning with an F uh, or troll you. Um, and, uh, you, know, say, you know, say a lot of bad things about you. Now, this was at a time when I was teaching full-time uh, college geology and to have people half my age on there you know call me a liar every two seconds or some other name it was just you know it was really off-putting i was disheartened again some years later uh to hear that i wasn't even a real urban explorer at all uh, and this came from a very different quarter this this kind of critique um apparently the teenagers who were calling me names those were the real explorers uh according to um some advocates of postmodern theory now my serious data collecting urban exploration was uh, seen to be at odds with postmodern theory um where the goal of urbex is merely play or something frivolous like it's not a directed um activity um moreover the the whole notion of urban exploration was attributed to an obscure french marxist i had never heard of um and that's guy de boer um was the founder of the situationist international of course, as I learned later. <laughs> um, and, you know, he's famous for writing of the spectacle of modern capitalist society, and how we're all sucked into that. Um, and he promoted the idea of the derive or drifting uh, through the city. Um, and I'm not, I don't have the time here to go into an elaborate description of how, of the method of drifting. Um, and one of them involves cutting up map fragments, kind of like you see on the right-hand side there. It's one of the illustrations. Um, first of all, let me say in favor of Guy Debord, um, I agree totally with him in the, in the, in the above ground sense. When I'm exploring a new city, I get to a new city. Um, I want to get off the beaten track. Um, and I, you know, I want to go see the stuff behind the facade and encounter new and weird aspects um, of the city. Um, and so, so that part I'm, I'm totally cool with. One of, one of the, my methods so-called for doing this is I like to follow urban stream courses and they will go through a whole succession of neighborhoods and you'll see all kinds of different changes um and this kind of gets you away from the you know the shopping mall experience and um certainly i was not the first person to think of this tim edensor has published a number of excellent articles on following urban streams and in how you know how he uses that to, to get um you know to experience uh new places or maybe even old places you want a new perspective on uh, Guy de Boer did not apply this uh, his drifting to the underground directly, so far as I'm aware. 
Um, but it it's it seems to be implied by other writers who do talk about include urban what I call urban caving in, in under the rubric of urban exploration. It's kind of like they they kind of package this as all the same thing. I I'm trying to point out here is I I, I disagree with that. Um, the drifting underground would be fatal in some circumstances. And just to take the example again of Paris. Um, where Guy Debord is famous for, for his drifts, um, his derives. Um, there was, uh, if you were to go into the Paris catacombs, which are fearfully complicated, and I've been down there, um, and if you were just to drift, you know, drift randomly down there, you would soon become lost and, um, potentially even die. And I mentioned this because uh, the patron saint of the explore of the exploration of the Paris catacombs. I didn't know it had such a thing, but uh, it does. Uh, his name is Philibert Aspert. Uh, he got lost in the Paris catacombs uh, in 1793, and he was found 11 years later. His body was in 1804, thoroughly decomposed, of course. Um, and they built a nice monument to him down there, which, uh, as I understand, ex ex exists to the present day. So there you go. That's what um, there's what that's what drifting will will get you down there. So um, here's some other reasons why I think that the postmodern um, <clears throat> paradigm doesn't fit urban exploration all that well. First of all, the very term urban exploration exploration um has a connotation of you know has colonial connotations uh, colonial baggage like you're the explorer coming in that no one else has seen this before you're the first one uh and uh which is you know which is completely bogus in in most urban environments um it is in my in my experience, that of many others, urban exploration is also a highly gendered practice. Okay, it is. It privileges young white males. It's kind of like their thing. Okay, uh, Guy Debord was very much against the. Uh, you know, he railed against the. Wrote that whole book. You know, the pursuit of spectacle. Um, and, uh, and, and how that, 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 you know, we're all caught up in that in capitalist societies. And oftentimes, you know, the, with urban exploration, what is the ultimate result of it? You know, somebody, um, you know, goes online and starts bragging about, uh, you know, posts on a website or on a blog or makes a YouTube video about themselves exploring a certain place. I mean, that to me is, um, they have been completely co-opted by consumer capitalism, especially you look at some of these uh, YouTube videos have millions of views and that, so there's a lot of uh, YouTube monetization in there. They're making, they're making money on that. So I, I think that's just points out the hollowness uh, of this whole approach. So after I've made all these, um, you know, the, after I, after all these ponderous, describing all these ponderous concerns and, uh, you know, laying out this gloomy philosophy for you, you might be asking yourself, why does this guy even bother with urban exploration? Um, so I'm going to switch here. And for the rest of my presentation, I'd like to highlight some of the, uh, the good uh, and fun things um, and some of what I have found uh, at, at what my goal oriented um, urban exploration or urban caving um, has actually. Okay, so now for some of the, uh, some examples, um, what I'm talking about, um, it, this, Urban exploration in Minnesota had a um, the history well before me. Um, a professor Harry Goering uh, wandered the sewers and he began bat 
banding in Minnesota, Minnesota sewers in 1951, as you can see in his 1961 Sunday supplement. Uh, he did a lot of uh, good research there. Uh, Dr. Christine Salmon of the University of Minnesota. Uh, she's been investigating uh, white nose syndrome uh, and potential cures for it and has been looking at cave sediments uh, in the, the urban area. Um, and uh, this kind of harks back to Salmon Waxman and his classic, um, you know, met, uh, remedy for tuberculosis that he found uh, in, in cave sediments um, back in the 1930s. Um, a little bit um, closer to home, or more recent, rather, um, St. Anthony Falls, which is um, the only major waterfall on the Mississippi River. Um, it is imperiled it is because there are some structures that are looking like they might collapse. Work that I did on, under the cities, under this waterfall, um, many years ago, um, are now informing some of the, the uh, investigations, and I'm involved with that also um, for how to prevent the catastrophic collapse uh, of this waterfall. Um, <clears throat> the largest cave under downtown Minneapolis, it goes by the name of Sheik's Cave. Um, and uh, upon studying this, I was able to determine that it was uh, it was not a natural cave, <clears throat> it's not an artificial cave, belongs to an intermediate category. <clears throat> I call it an anthropogenic cave. It's like, as I said, gigantic sewer washout. Um, and this is a <clears throat> kind of a novel thing in the taxonomy of St. Peter Caves, again, as a result of my urban exploration. I think one of the most significant things uh, that came out of my brand of urban exploration, as I always go around with measuring things. Um, and um, I measured the, the spring in this Sheik's, in Sheik's Cave, a spring of water coming out of the ceiling. You see a cross section of the city and the cave here um, in this, this diagram here, which is in a peer reviewed paper. Um, I found that the groundwater under Minneapolis, um, it, there's, there's a significant subsurface urban heat island and the groundwater temperatures elevated 11 degrees Celsius above the background temperature. So this is like, I would have to say like the most interesting find resulting from urban exploration um, under Minneapolis. Uh, the city of St. Paul uh, was supposed to have begun or been born at a cave, the Fountain Cave, which you see here on the left. Um, and I did a lot of research on that and I found a map at the Public Works archives. You see that on the right hand side. And I determined that this cave was actually a sinking stream system in Pseudokarst. Um, and again, this is a result of urban exploration uh, activities. Another fruit uh, of uh, urban exploration um, is that I, um, looking at a geological map, I saw there's a place where a fault line crossed a sewer tunnel. I went down there uh, and was able to actually locate fault breccia and an actual expression of that fault in the walls of the sewer, something that the state, the Minnesota state geologist was very interested in, asked to accompany me uh, on a special trip down there to look at. So just finishing up here, uh, in summary, situationism uh, is a fine above ground urbex philosophy and practice. And I, I agree with it to that extent. I, you know, it's something I do myself in, 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 in one way of speaking. Um, but you have to be careful when applied to the, when you kind of lump in the underground in urban exploration, it certainly doesn't apply down there. And it's even actually silly and uh, potentially deadly to uh, to suggest someone do a derive or drift um, underground. 
I'm sorry I can't be here in, in person to uh, take your questions, but uh, there's my website. You can communicate with me, join my Facebook group, anything like that. Again, there's the uh, there's the spectacle. So <laughs> thank you very much um, for attending my talk. Okay, so that was uh, Greg's contribution, and I've just seen a couple of comments popping up uh, uh, in in the chat. I think um, what we've seen throughout the four presentations is the sort of interplay between the adventure and the and the quote scientific, the the, the more speli speleological um, dimension. And I think in terms of the spectrum, we're seeing Greg more towards the you go underground to find things out not to have not to have adventure but then he also acknowledges that there is a certain degree of adventure for him but then activates an issue that i've heard denzel talking about before and i've seen him mention it in the chat and interestingly kevin has done a thumbs up to denzel's comment so i want to invite denzel and kevin in really to comment on the how does the youtube and the props monetization of uh of x thrill undermine interfere with live alongside the more private private pleasure uh dimension of of, of urbex and what what friction does it cause i think we're hearing some of the friction in terms of personal experience that greg feels he, he he's picked up along the way i just wonder whether denzel and or kevin you, you'd like to uh, contribute there asking perhaps denzel um to go first yeah so yeah i think i have i have, I have views on um I think I think by its very nature, I think urban exploring is is a covert hobby. Um, you know, we we we've obviously you know we're obviously all aware of the the sort of legalities that surround it. Um, it, it is it is it is a an underground if you pardon the phrase an an, an underground occupation. Um, and some of these places that the people explore are 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 sort of not very well known. And as soon as they get put out there in 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 social media, um, a lot of the YouTubers come along. And and you know film these places, spend more time with the camera pointing at them rather than the uh, location. They they put them out on the YouTube channel. You know, hundreds of thousands of people see them, and the places either get trashed, or um, you know they, they they get filled up, which then puts that that space that that space to explore you know out out of bounds of other people. So that I think that's what the tension is. Um, you know, often you know, it's not it's not. So you you mentioned the the urbex sites. It isn't just what gets posted on the urbex sites. It's what doesn't get posted. And sometimes the really interesting stuff is the stuff that doesn't get posted. And I think a real urban explorer will, will have this sort of um, this radar where they they know not to post stuff. And 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 there seems to be this sort of myth, you know, in the, with with a lot of the YouTubers. So they say, well, we didn't we didn't name the location. Well, no, it, it isn't actually naming the location. It's actually arousing the suspicion of the place. Because in this day and age, if you if you put a place up there, some and, and say, well, I'm, I'm not naming it, somebody will find it, and and then you know, obviously that place gets trashed or sealed. Kevin, did you want to chip in? Yeah, I think I think my experience in New Zealand is really um, kind of. There's a good example, really. Um, when I first went across there, urban exploration was quite um, like very few people did it, um, which was very surprising considering the massive earthquake cities, you know, like Christchurch, that were largely abandoned still, even though it was many years after the disaster. And when we started exploring, we had free reign of this place. You know, there were very few things, obstacles in the way to stop us, very few um, security personnel in the way to stop you. And you were just dipping in and out of buildings. We were going in and out of the cathedrals and things, you know, big major buildings. Um, and I would say probably a year and a half after we'd explored them, that's when the hype moved in. But like this happened in the UK and the YouTube channel started to come out. Uh, Rooftop and became really big in, in New Zealand and it changed things, you know, dramatically. Uh, the whole scene of Urbex, it became more about, you know, getting the Instagram worthy shots on, on the top of the buildings or getting into these sites in, in Christchurch um for, for the great shots but then that's the moment security moves in and it, especially Christchurch um they built like a massive wall made out of logs you know to stop people getting in and uh they employed security guards at that point and it was no longer that city where you could go and have free reign of the place it changed the atmosphere and for me that was that was a change that's not not the sort of urban exploration that was that's not the reason I got into it really I, I liked the the other side of it so I think that's a good example um, yeah 
Thank you. I'm going to ask Maria whether, from a point of view of caving, there's there's a YouTube interference cultural effect these days. Um, boy, um, it depends on where. Um, I'm I I do not inhabit the world of social media very much. I confess, um, but I do know that social media platforms, in their great diversity, have been very important um, for caver communities to connect with each other. So of course, you know, I actually have my first PhD student actually studied like digital geographies, right? And she was very astute in reminding me that when we think of social media and when we think about these platforms, there are many dimensions, right? They can be really helpful for people within a community to share information. But I think what we're talking about here is this idea of the performative public projection of what people are doing and that is when it be, it can become really problematic in all kinds of ways but as i've also been reminded from people in fact my my friend um friends in puerto rico uh, tamara and and so on people who are actually quite astute about raising awareness of stories of conservation social media platform can also be really um effective means of raising awareness and in a conservation ethos among communities that you would not reach otherwise, right? So, so I think it, we've seen this in many areas, right? This kind of like this double-edged sword of whether and how social media platforms are used and, and how. And I think it was Denzel who mentioned the special radar. <laughs> I think there are certain, I mean, I, I think within certain communities of practice, that radar sent, tends to be maybe a little sharper, and there's almost like an unspoken and sometimes quite explicit rules of engagement, right? I mean, just to give you a, a clear example as well, I mean, a lot of caving in the US happens in private land. No way in hell would you stay friends with cavers if you start posting all kinds of stuff in social media about caves um, on the, the property of a landowner who has already been very cautious about giving you access, right? So, so this idea of, again, really trying to understand the broader geographies of exploration, that includes this issues of trust, not, all, not only just legal parameters, but also issues of trust and who you share information with are actually very touchy. But again, it really depends on what we're talking about. You go to the Western US and you have less of the property, the, the, the private property. It's more like state and, and federally managed forests. Different rules of engagement play out there. How different cave surveys play out. I can go on and on and on. So I think it plays out in different ways. Um, but. I mean, I tend to work with people that are within a certain kind of institutional umbrella, and I'm not saying academic, I'm saying, you know, caver communities that understand that there are certain rules of engagement, not only in terms of protecting property, protecting caves, but also making sure that people don't get hurt or killed, right? Because then that brings in a whole other dimension of mobilizing people who have to step in for a rescue and put their own lives in danger. So anyway, I'll leave it there. No, thank you. That, that, those those are three great contributions. Um, I can't see anything in the chat. Uh, I, I'm just wondering whether anybody has any comments either in relation to uh, any of the other points that Greg raised or any points that they'd like to raise to draw the whole proceeding together. Um, I think there may be one point that's just come in in the chat. Just let me scroll down. Uh, Okay, so this is a, a comment, or is it a question from Kyle? Uh, I'm not quite sure who it's directed to, because it can't be directed to Greg, because Greg's not here. Um, are you looking forward to a time when overt performance of some YouTubers moves on to another topic, leaving the sites and areas to be, to a more limited audience? So is, is there a prospect of an audience collapse that would take us back in time to a previous position or is, is is time's arrow not reversible and we're we're in a new reality and have to learn to live with it anyone want to take that one denzel i, I think there's a real demand um for, for, for the youtube channels i think there's a there's a whole there's there's a whole group of people who are really fascinated by exploring uh abandoned burning uh, abandoned buildings, abandoned buildings and and caves but haven't haven't got the know-how or or perhaps the the sort of explorer um 
like guys to do it so and there is a bit you know you look at some of these youtube channels and there's just thousands and thousands of hits mm. so i i think i think there's a big demand um out there for these youtube channels i i don't know what's gonna i don't know what's gonna make that that that, that reduce um because at the moment it's, it is a big revenue stream for the, yeah. for, the, for the youtubers um the irony of this this sub conversation has now suddenly struck me, and that of course this is going to be uploaded to YouTube. Not that it's going to be monetized, because sadly we don't get the kind of traction that the adventurous YouTubers get. But uh, um, to to echo Maria's point, really, that the the social media dimension has positives, has negatives, um, and it, and it is by the means of social media that we're having this event today, and that we're propagating whatever our discursive view uh and vicarious enjoyment of underground exploration um may have been over the last two and a half hours maria you got your hand up yeah um yeah one of the things i i, I think about um and again I, I i regret greg is not here um one of the things that i that i really enjoy about these sessions and and the mix of papers that we have here is is is, is there's it's a reminder that um I think there's really good value that comes from unmooring, unmooring tired words, right? Um, so Denzel does a lot of that with his work, even just this diffusion of enthusiasm for just the joy of getting to see places and move and, and see, you know, learn about history in a different way. Um, Kevin does that also beautifully in his work book, as I've already talked about, but words like when in practices like science, exploration, I would even say mapping, the underground, all of these things, part of what makes, it's really cool to question the premises and the assumptions that undergird these concepts, right? So yeah, exploration is caught up with this history of colonization, but exploration is also part of like human development for those of us who have babies and kids. <laughs> I mean, part of our capacity to become human and, and engage in our humanness, right? Is to crawl, explore, tinker. Like babies who can't do that, there is actually like a term in medicine, like failure to thrive. I mean, the point is, Going back in the spirit to of ontogenesis and developmental trajectories of humans, non-human beings, and also you know phenomena that form this earth. When we think about exploration and engaging with different dimensions of our environment and of and with each other, is a really important part of learning and connecting and becoming what we become. Right. So that's also exploration, isn't it? So so to unmoor the notion of exploration and movement and kind of like this bodily joy, right? But also the terror that comes from doing something kind of weird, um, unmooring that from just the view of like the imperial wide colonial erasure and violence, right? I think it's important work that this group does, like really broadening the range of what is possible. And it's not a denial of the first, but it's a broadening of the conversation so we include these other ways in which these things can manifest themselves. And I think that's really cool. I think that's an important work to do. And it's a better way of acknowledging the full range of our humanity. Um, anyway, I just a comment, I guess. No, no it, it, it's quite an epic comment, which I think is great. And I, I don't want to try and top that. So I'm going to let you have the last word. Um, thank you, Maria. Thank you, everybody. Super duper. It's now coming up to 9.30. Uh, and thank you all. And um, in due course, the recording will be online. And remember the few forthcoming sessions, if they're of any interest to you. Next time, we'll be on the rocks. So awesome. thank you, one and all. We'll be there. Thank you very much. Have a great time. Bye. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Cheers, mate. Cheers, Kevin. See ya. Take care. Take care. Take care.